All right, so it's 10 or 3 and uh, I think we should get started just for the sake of time and so that we can stay on schedule. Um, welcome to the afternoon session in the in Eastern Canada, We're still morning here in Vancouver. Um, on behalf of David Burney and the rest of the uh, speakers today, I would like to welcome you all to uh, this session, <coughs> which is uh, um, called um, um, Diagnosis and Treatment of Cardiac Sarcoidosis. It gives me great pleasure to co-host this session with Dr. Burney. Uh, this is the second Card Canadian Cardiac uh, Sarcoidosis Symposium. We had the first one a few years ago in Vancouver, and, and this time it's virtually being done from Ottawa. We have a great uh, list of uh, speakers today from all across not only Canada, but from the United States and the United Kingdom. So we're very fortunate to have all these high caliber speakers. Um, we will have a slight change in the schedule this morning uh, or afternoon. Um, we will start with Dr. Um, uh, Rob Beanland, uh, who will be discussing PET imaging of cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, update on techniques, indications, recent guidelines, and future directions. And hopefully Rob will uh, tell us how we can get PET scanners in our institutions. Uh, <laughs> and maybe he'll pay for them too, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Beatlands needs really very little introduction. I think he is extremely well known in this uh, field. He's the Deputy Director General at the University uh, of Ottawa Heart Institute, and he's the former uh, Chair and Chief of the Division of Cardiology as well, and Founding Director of the National Cardiac Pet Center. He's a highly accomplished uh, clinician and researcher who has a, such a long bio that I'm going to not read it all. Okay. Uh, needless to say, uh, highly published in um, in imaging, not just for cardiac pet, but for just for cardiac imaging in general. And we're extremely fortunate to have him speak today. So thank you, Rob, for joining us. Okay, great. So thanks, Mustafa, for the kind introduction, and to you and David um, and Ian Patterson for inviting me, and to Bonnie Chan for excellent uh, organization of this. Um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, first of many uh, symposia around rare, rare diseases um, and uh, many more uh, around cardiac sarcoidosis. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about PET imaging for, for cardiac sarcoidosis. These are my disclosures. Um, I do want to uh, give a shout out to David, uh, as well as uh, Daniel, Panitia, Ron, and Christiane, all of whom I've borrowed slides from. Uh, and thoughts and ideas for this presentation. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use guidelines for PET and position statements as a framework to cover why, what, how, who, when for cardiac sarcoidosis and PET imaging. We'll talk about FDG uptake and glucose metabolism. We'll talk about preparation and imaging diagnosis. We'll talk about indications and then briefly on diagnostic challenges and, and briefly on novel tracers and then summarize. So I, I show my granddaughter here, uh, almost four years old. She's going to help us through these questions. The first is why. So we know the diagnosis of sarcoid requires three elements, the compatibility with clinical imaging manifestations, the exclusion of other diseases that may present similarity, and the histopathological detection of non caseating granulomas. We'll hear more about the disease and, and diagnosis uh, from others. Um, but I wanted to cover briefly with you that now both the Heart Rhythm Society and the Japanese Society Sarcoidosis um, uh, <clears throat> guidelines include uh, um, advanced imaging with uh, PET or MR. Uh, this did not used to be the case, and I think this is an important step forward uh, for both understanding the disease and its detection and uh, management, uh, following the management. So the why do we need advanced cardiac imaging to diagnose cardiac sarcoid? Well, first and foremost, it is a challenging diagnosis. The criteria have limited supporting data. They lack prospective validation uh, compared to the gold standard. And the gold standard is recognized to be biopsy, uh, which is highly specific when positive, however, has very poor sensitivity uh, because of sampling and various other factors, and as well carries inherent risks. Um, echocardiography, which is obviously ubiquitous in terms of its availability, however, has a low sensitivity for detection of sarcoid, um, and it really provides no information on disease activity or extracardiac sarcoid disease. Uh, 
Um, MRI we know is highly sensitive. It can provide us with morphological and functional uh, tissue characterization, and it can differentiate cardiac sarcoid from other mimickers. It is the best method for detecting scar, and, and uh, particularly with T2-weighted imaging, can provide uh, information on cardiac inflammation. FTG-PET, however, is recognized as the most sensitive method and the best for disease activity and extracardiac sarcoidosis. It can detect scar, although not as uh, well as MRI. So uh, what are we doing with this? Uh, so we're looking at FTG and glucose utilization, inflammatory cells versus normal cells. So in an inflammatory cell, FTG, as you can see, and glucose go into the cell uh, according to uh, or, or um, carried by GLUT1 and GLUT3 transporters. Um, and this is similar uptake under all conditions, which allows us to image hot spots in the heart and elsewhere. With normal myocardium, um, FTG and glucose go in um, uh, via the GLUT4 transporter. However, this is dependent on insulin levels as well as the metabolic state. When insulin is high or when free fatty acids are low, there is a lot of glucose and FTG uptake in the myocardium. And in fact, this is not what we want when we're imaging inflammation. Um, when insulin is low and free fatty acids are high, you get very little myocardial uptake. And this is in fact what we want to achieve um, with inflammatory imaging with FDG. Um, and really it is about the preparation of the patient to enable this um, uh, limited FDG uptake uh, in the myocardium to allow us to detect the inflammation. So how do we do this? So um, as you heard uh, the importance of uh, preparation of the patient to enable the visualization of inflammation is key. And this can be achieved through uh, fasting, through dietary manipulation with a ketogenic diet, um, heparin, which increases free fatty acid levels, but mostly uh, combined approaches achieve this to the, uh, with the greatest success rate. You can also add vigorous exertion, and it's important for the patient to keep a record of their prep so you know that they have um, uh, prepared for the scans uh, properly. So how does this happen? Um, so you begin with the high fat, low carbohydrate diet, um, and you can add uh, avoiding vigorous activity and so on. Um, this uh, is followed then by perfusion imaging. This can be with PET, uh, or SPECT if PET is not available. Um, we follow this by low dose uh, unfractionated heparin. Um, um, centers may use 50 units and according to the guidelines, but we use only 15 because this is all that's required to raise the free fatty acid levels and does not change the prothrombin level. Um, uh, followed by an uptake phase, uh, you can either go with cardiac imaging first. In our hands, we do whole body imaging first. Um, uh, but it, 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 the ASNIC guidelines suge suggest you can do cardiac first uh, um, in those circumstances. Um, it is important to include at least a minimum of the chest and liver and spleen. In our hands, we try to use, use whole body imaging because of the added information that this provides. So here's an example of a high fat, low carbohydrate. You can see it's um, uh, uh, fat and protein all day long. Um, a couple of key pearls is to avoid IV dextrose and IV dextrose meds. This is important on inpatients and it's often forgotten. Um, so you want to make sure that this is not the case in the 24 hours prior to the scan. Um, and don't forget that uh, things like milk and breads and muffins and nuts and sauces all contain carbohydrates. It's amazing how many people including healthcare providers, forget this. Um, you need a little bit of extra caution with patients who have diabetes who are on insulin, and we will often consult our endocrinology colleagues for help uh, when we need to prepare for those patients. So here's an example of uh, an excellent prep where there's no FTG uptake, a medium prep where there's some, and a poor prep where there's a lot of um, uh, FTG uptake throughout the myocardium, and you can see why you wouldn't be able to de detect inflammation in this patient. You can see that there are variants of this 
In this example, you can see that the lateral wall often has uptake uh, in, in patients with poor preparation, and it doesn't need to be the whole myocardium. So you need to be cautious with that as well. So the classic diagnostic criteria are for focal uptake or focal on diffuse uptake. So looking for those focal hotspots uh, of FDG. So how do we interpret this? Well, these can be normal perfusion accompanied by no uptake, which is normal, or you can have the diffuse uptake as we've just seen with, with poor preparation. You can have abnormal perfusion with a perfusion defect or metabolism of focal hotspot. Uh, so one or the other being abnormal, or you can have both perfusion and metabolism being abnormal. Um, being in the same region, those are classic mismatch pattern. Um, uh, being uh, focal on diffuse with, uh, with partial uh, mismatch and partial in other areas or in two completely separate areas. Um, and it, these are important because uh, they carry prognostic value. So the most recent meta-analysis is from Kim and they looked at this, the accuracy of PET from multiple studies um, and showed that the overall sensitivity and specificity using varying criteria from the different studies uh, was uh, approximately 83 and 84% with an AUC of 0.9. And as I mentioned, when one of the areas is abnormal, one is abnormal, either abnormal perfusion or metabolism shown in blue, these patients have worse prognosis and even worse if both are abnormal. Um, I'm not going to, there are quantitative methods and I'm not going to go through this in detail except to highlight that they, that they, um, they have not been so well validated. Uh, there's not really standardized approaches, so they, they may have limited um, uh, capabilities beyond relative qualitative imaging. However, there are a couple of circumstances where they may be of value. The first is uh, when measuring the standard uptake value, which is a a measure of the amount of FDG in the area, in the tissue uh, in question, corrected for uh, the amount injected. Um, and essentially it's been shown that over time, um, the reduction in SUV relates to improvement in ventricular function. So this could be potentially useful in follow-up. Um, the other factor I wanna bring to your attention is the coefficient of variation, which is really a measure of the overall heterogeneity of the uptake, so hot and cold areas of FDG, the more there is of this, um, this is among several other uh, um, important outcome, independent outcome predictors. Uh, of interest is the most significant outcome predictor was pre-existing ventricular arrhythmias. So who should be getting FDG PET? Um, so we know from that for screening, uh, for cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, biopsy proven extracardiac sarcoidosis um, should be considered in patients who have symptoms, uh, palpitations or syncope, uh, abnormal ECG or abnormal echo. And, uh, and based on the European guidelines, um, when cardiac sarcoidosis is, is suspected in patients with known extracardiac sarcoid, the preferred initial approach is with um, a cardiac MRI. Um, and if this is Ab abnormal, unavailable, or contraindicated, then FTG PET could be considered, and using this information, make decisions about immune suppression and ICD, uh, and obviously if MRI is available, um, also in combination with MRI to make decisions regarding ICD. So following David's talk this morning using celebrities, uh, uh, celebrity patients as an example, um, this is an example from a 44-year-old paramedic who was working in Afghanistan and presented with generally feeling unwell um, and somewhat pre-syncopal who developed complete heart block and he was brought home to Canada uh, for workup. And the question is whether a patient like this, um, a young patient presenting with complete heart block, is this an indication to work up for sarcoid? Um, and certainly it, it is. Uh, for situations w in which cardiac presentations can be the first and or un an unrecognized manifestation of sarcoid, uh, there are several, including the un unexplained uh, high-grade AV block, and 25 to 34% of these patients may have cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, 
in patients with sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia of unknown etiology, so other etiologies ruled out, um, 20 to 25% of these patients can have cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, cardiac sarcoid can mimic this condition, and obviously uh, idiopathic heart failure, although rarely, uh, can also be a presentation for cardiac sarcoidosis. So in our example, <clears throat> you can see this patient did have sarcoid imaging. You can see the myocardial uptake and as well Hyler and other uh, lymph node uptake. Uh, you can see that there is activity at the apex, the basal septum, which is quite classic. As well, there's RV uptake, which is a poor prognostic sign. The perfusion, though, is relatively intact. And so this patient was offered both steroid therapy and ICD. He did accept the ICD, but declined steroid therapy. Um, it's important to keep in mind that for the diagnosis, uh, the FTG PET can be supportive, but it does not make the diagnosis of sarcoid. Um, this uh, biopsy would be recommended, um, and certainly extracardiac biopsy should be tried first, um, uh, if feasible. And then if not, then consider guided endomyocardial biopsy. And that's what happened in this patient uh, to confirm the diagnosis um, before he was offered a device and a steroid therapy. So he declined the steroid therapy. Um, and you can see what happened here that his perfusion got worse. There's more extensive perfusion abnormalities and his FTG uptake became more extensive. So the disease did progress. Um, uh, he then uh, actually, not long after this follow-up, had a cardiac arrest that was um, um, appropriately defibrillated, um, saving his life, uh, of course, but at that point he did agree to steroid therapy and improved from there. So when should we consider this? Um, so the European guidelines uh, support that FGG-PET um, should be used at, as start of therapy and then following periods of immunosuppressive therapy, there should be a repeat scan um, with re and to look for reductions in uptake. And if this is present, one could consider tapering immunosuppressive therapy. Um, and if it's not present, to consider adding or modifying the immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and uh, David uh, Bernie and uh, 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 Christian Weefels have uh, looked at this over time and shown that uh, when you look at FDG uptake uh, response, you can actually distinguish patients who may um, uh, uh, maintain their response or relapse. And what's important is that this was done safely without risk for the patients. Um, and these patients would then, uh, who had relapse, could then be uh, intervened upon for uh, further courses of therapy or changes in therapy, whereas these patients could be maintained um, off steroid therapy for prolonged periods of time. And importantly, these patients did not have, uh, in the responding group, did not have subsequent long-term events. So what's next? So we know that FTG has, has problems. Uh, it can uh, also be taken up in hibernating myocardium, other inflammatory myopathies, myocarditis, and as you saw, it can be physiological, uh, uh, normal uptake in the myocardium. And the, you know, the, the Achilles heel really is the preparation, which is um, uh, challenging for uh, many labs to undertake and for patients as well. Um, uh, and if this could be, if we could rid ourselves of the need for this, uh, this could potentially improve diagnostic capabilities. Um, as an example of a problem of hibernation, this is an example who clearly this patient is riddled with uh, sarcoidosis. And you can see that there is perfusion defects as well as FDG uptake. Uh, what's of interest, though, is that there is a perfusion defect that's fairly extensive in the inferior wall, and there is mismatch in the inferior wall as well. And in fact, this patient had both cardiac sarcoidosis and myocardial hibernation. They had a tight right coronary artery stenosis, um, really highlighting the challenge in making the diagnosis in these patients. So there's been several different tracers that are being explored. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, it, it suffices to say, FTG is widely available. 
it's the preparation that's a problem. Um, and all of these continue to be explored as potential alternatives uh, for uh, imaging inflammation. We have looked at um, um, uh, FLT, uh, basically uh, fluorine L-thymidine, um, and have shown that in certainly in whole body imaging, there is a good correlation with the with FDG. Um, uh, with cardiac, however, it does appear to be more related to the extent of perfusion defects than than FDG uptake per se. Um, so time will tell whether this becomes a potential option uh, for PET imaging. So to summarize, I want to highlight the um, Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, which have uh, pointed out that there's three three areas where FTG PET would be the preferred approach. That would be young patients with um, a presentation of advanced conduction disease uh, to look at the response to immunosuppressive therapy. And for patients with uh, manifest cardiac sarcoid, where they have increasing ventricular arrhythmia burden. Um, in Ontario, we've established a special access program because it wasn't initially available through the fee code. Um, we've now recently approved three indications and we're just waiting for the fee code um, uh, adjustments. But um, uh, one, if one has biopsy proven or a clinical diagnosis of sarcoid, uh, extra sar cardiac sarcoid, with MR findings suggestive of it, this would be an approved indication for FTG. High-grade conduction disease, uh, we've taken patients over uh, at the cutoff age of 70, and then for follow-up treatment. Uh, for these indications, you don't need any further review. There are a host of other indications where the province provides uh, a review of um, the circumstances, whether or not the patient's a candidate or not. So uh, in summary, cardiac diagnosis, diagnosis is challenging. FTG PET does add to diagnostic capabilities. There are many guidelines that support this. The preparation is key. It defines inflammation and also scar with for perfusion imaging. It's supportive, but not diagnostic. Um, it is the test of choice in young patients with advanced AV block and to follow response to therapy. It provides a prognostic value, particularly if there's abnormal perfusion FDG and if there's a high coefficient of variation. It can diagnose extra cardiac sarcoid. Um, new traces are being investigated and we need randomized control trials. I'm sure that Dr. Bernie will be highlighting this um, in uh, upcoming presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Well, Beekman, for what a great presentation. Um, I'd like to open the like discussion if possible. Um, um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, I, I would like to, you know, if you have a question, please either put it in the chat or um, put your hand up and then we can see if we can um, uh, get you um, to, to ask the question. But Rob, I'll ask you a couple of questions if you don't mind, just to start off sure. this discussion. Now, the, the prep is very important and there is sort of different ideas about the, how long the prep should be. What's an ideal prep duration pre-PET scan? So we, we, we do the cardi ketogenic diet for the 24 hours before, so the three meals on the day before the scan, um, and then ask the patient for a 12 hour fast. Um, because I've heard there are some centers that are advocating 72 hours of, of, of a prep diet. Yes, there are, and they have achieved potentially greater reduction, um, uh, uh, at least according to their published data. Uh, I, I think three days of that type of diet is hard to be strict with. Um, uh, we've had pretty good success um, with the 24-hour preparation. In fact, our bigger problem is not the outpatients, but inpatients, um, uh, sometimes with the IVs and so on. So, um, and, and you saw some of the common mistakes that people make in their prep. Um, I think if, you, if you're diligent and you provide good, solid advice, the 24 hours is going to get you there um, most of the time. Yeah, and related to that, and I think Liz and I are on the same page here, um, is, is the diabetics, the, both the insulin dependent and the non-insulin dependents, because those those can be challenging patients to to scan. Are there sort of cutoffs for uh, A1C or or uh, 
glucose, fasting glucose levels or 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 what's how how do we best manage that? I have to say that in Vancouver we haven't been utilizing endocrine as much as maybe we should. Yeah, so if if the patient has a fasting blood sugar over 13, we won't do the scan. 13 or more. Um uh we'll we'll defer. Um uh, and if mostly the patients who are not on insulin, they, they can be managed reasonably well, um, uh, holding their meds on the day of the scan. They usually only need the morning meds on the day before, um, and they can usually tolerate the ketogenic diet. The ones on insulin are, are a bit more problematic, um, and it's those patients that we'll often consult an endocrinologist to help us with. The key is that they take their, um, if they're taking nighttime insulin, if it's possible them, for them to take it in the morning, except on the day of the scan, um, we try to do that. If it's not possible, if they're very brittle, then what we try to do is to ensure that it's at least 12 hours before the scan. Um, and as well, we, we actually advise the patients as well before the scan, you know, that we want to try to get their blood sugars down below 10 um, on a regular basis before they're coming for the scan um, so that they're aware and their physician's aware. And then and then um, we'll also, uh, we're pretty strict about the diabetic patients being the first patients um, off the mark in the morning of the, of the, of the day. So to, to try to make sure that that happens as well, because then they can get back on their meds and, uh, and so on. Um, I see. I see. David has his hand up. Maybe before yeah. David asks the question, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask Jordana's question, which is a common thing that we see as well. Is how do you interpret isolated lateral wall FDG uptake? That's a great question. Um, for sure, uh, the isolated lateral wall can be a challenge. Um, generally, it's diffuse and sort of tapers down towards the apex. It's often combined with sort of a basal ring. And you know, I think it has to do with the difference in um, the fact that it's less in the septum, really the, the difference in metabolism between the septum and, and lateral wall, which, um, which has been well known for some time that there is those, those differences. The, the, it, it probably does reflect, reflect suboptimal prep um, uh, in, in patients. Um, and so I think we, we look for other clues as well. Uh, is this an isolated finding? It's pretty rare to have isolated uh, sarcoid. Um, is there MR findings that support it and so on? So we look for those, uh, those types of information and also review the prep, et cetera. Uh, most of the time when it's by itself without any other uptake, it's a uh, it's a normal variant or, or, or a result of poor prep. Yeah, wonderful. David, uh, maybe I'll get you to ask your question or comment. Well, my question is, as you know, uh, patients hate the preparation. I don't understand it because where I'm from. Yeah, I've... look at, yeah, look at, the, look at the, the diet. I know. I know. It's a normal day's food for me. Yeah. Um, so my question is um, really, how close are we with these new agents? Uh, I don't think we're that close. Um, the thing about FTG is it it's very widely available. It's got wide approval from all um, uh, you know federal regulatory agencies across the world. Um, uh, so and and it's used widely for other things. So it, it's it's really hard to to challenge that. I, the reason I think we're not close is that these uh, many of these other agents require um, re approval and they can be costly. I think the FLT is something worth considering because it is used for other other tech, other diseases, prostate cancer, and so on. So it it may be one that that could be um, could be used soon. Um, but I think we we need a lot more uh, work uh, on those tracers. So I, I'm. I'm sad to say that they're not that close. Bob, in, in less than 15 seconds, uh, vigorous activity before the scan. Do you, do you do you tell athletes, elite athletes, to refrain? Yes. For how long? Oh, I, that's a good question. 
Um, generally, we're asking people to refrain for 24 hours beforehand, along with the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Excellent. What a, a great way to start this meeting. We really appreciate your time, Rob. Uh, always a, a great thought leader and well respected in this field. And so we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Mustafa. I, um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the session. Likewise, thank you. And with that, we'll move along to the next speaker uh, and topic. Um, it's uh, given me a great pr uh, pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Basilis Coronos. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, right. I apologize if I'm not. We will be discussing uh, screening for cardiac involvement in patients with extracardiac sarcoidosis. Now, uh, Vasilis is very humble. He, he gave me just a very short bio. He's a consultant respirologist at the Royal Brompton Hospital and our honorary senior lecturer at the Imperial College in London. But when I Googled him, um, it's clear that uh, uh, he has uh, quite an extensive knowledge and background in cardiac sarcoidosis, having performed a PhD in uh, uh, on screening CMR in patients with biopsy-proven sarcoidosis. And he's completed a, a fellowship in inter interstitial lung disease and has subspecialized in sarcoidosis, and particularly in cardiac sarcoidosis. Not bad for a respirologist, Vasily. So uh, welcome to the, um, the light side from, from the respir respirology world. So thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to your talk. So I have no disclosures and uh, I will start by mentioning that, uh, as we all know, cardiac sarcoidosis is uh, the second most um, common cause of death in the sarcoidosis population, known for its risk of sudden cardiac death with high morbidity uh, defined by advanced AV block, sustained ventricular tachycardia, heart failure, and supraventricular arrhythmias. Uh, in, a, in a French cohort um, analyzing the mortality, you can see that patients who had the, the first cause of death was chronic respiratory disease uh, accounting for around 20 percent and heart disease was around 17 percent but when you break it down you can see that chronic heart disease and most likely cardiac sarcoidosis was actually uh, similar to uh, lung fibrosis as a cause of mortality in the general sarcoidosis population and um, this paper from 2019 showed that the prevalence of sudden cardiac death is around 14 percent and uh, as you can see we now have uh, more and more diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis but actually the autopsy uh, prevalence um, diagnosis remains uh, roughly the same which is a challenge for for when we're thinking about screening these patients now I think that uh, more and more we we have reached the point where we recognize um, a rather distinct cohort of patients. Um, the first cohort of patients are patients with known extra cardiac disease, and these are patients who have an established uh, sarcoidosis diagnosis. And they um, uh, the question is, what is the screening process in this particular condition? We have patients who have clinical manifestations of cardiac sarcoidosis, and they are considered to be around five to 10% of the uh, general sarcoidosis population, but actually advanced imaging modalities such as PET shown earlier and MRI have uh, identified a much higher prevalence of patients so a much higher subclinical disease. Now, um, as we became more aware of the disease, we have been seeing more and more unexplained cardiac manifestations as first presentation, which later on you get um, extra cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis, or as Dr. Cron requests, uh, asked the previous question, you may have isolated cardiac disease with a very challenging diagnosis on that basis uh, because there are not many, uh, the, the confidence is um, relatively low in most of the cases. The cardiac manifestations in the both the general, uh, in, in, in both known sarcoidosis, but also uh, not known sarcoidosis. Uh, patients depend on the anatomical location, the disease extent and activity. And some of the symptoms are usually palpitations, chest pain and syncope. Chest pain is usually atypical and I would like to emphasize that a lot of these patients may uh, report disproportionate breathlessness that cannot, cannot be explained from um, the respiratory investigations. Um, I will not bother you a lot with the ECG abnormalities. I imagine you are much more familiar uh, than me, uh, but we tend to see conduction abnormalities, ventricular arrhythmias, supraventricular arrhythmias, and other 
abnormalities that actually are included in the uh, Japanese guidelines for detection of the disease. Echocardiographic abnormalities include uh, left and right ventricular systolic or diastolic dysfunction, regional wall motion abnormalities, wall thinning or thickening, ventricular uh, aneurysms, and very rarely valvular dysfunction and pericardial effusions. So the role of the screening needs to be clarified. And um, when looking up what screening means, it means to detect the disease at an early and asymptomatic phase when treatment can be more effective than after the patient develops signs or symptoms. So that is very challenging. And the second thing is to identify risk factors for developing the disease, such as the disease can be prevented by modifying those. So by um, considering that you, we, have, um, we have agreed that the treatment in sarcoidosis changes the disease natural history. And I think that there have been a lot of challenges about that. In addition to that, um, we believe that the pathogenesis and diagnosis of sarcoidosis is well established, but actually it isn't, and especially in the cardiac sarcoidosis subgroup. So a lot of things need to be done for screening. Now, um, I, um, I looked up a paper uh, by uh, Mark Judson uh, regarding the screening uh, for sarcoidosis patients with, with uh, screening for cardiac sarcoidosis in sarcoidosis population. We are looking into highly sensitive, widely available, safe, cost-effective tools and uh, strategies that would improve health outcomes. So um, in order to succeed all these five targets, I think that the next slide will show us the actual tool that we have in, uh, in our hands. And this is um, the reality. Now, we are working a lot in building up the right strategy and I'll take you through what we know and uh, what I think that we can actually improve. Now, um, I will break it down to the uh, patients with known extra cardiac sarcoidosis as well as the general population, primarily using the guidelines from the sudden, uh, from sudden, sudden cardiac death. Now, this is the um, a recommendation by the Heart Rhythm Society um, consensus statement on the diagnosis and management of arrhythmias and cardiac sarcoidosis. And as you can see, in patients where you have um, a, a confident extra cardiac sarcoidosis, I would say, so as we know now, you, you may not need a 100% a, a biopsy proven disease, but a highly confident diagnosis may be appropriate, but um, this is open for discussion. In those particular patients, um, you, are, you are assessing their cardiac history, the, an ECG, and potentially an echocardiogram. Now, from a symptoms point of view, I, the symptoms are the ones that I showed you earlier, but you need to uh, remember that um, palpitation should be quite regular and more than twice a week, um, not something that is very occasional and intermittent. The other thing is, when we're talking about ECG abnormalities, you need to be very well aware of all the different abnormalities included, such as axis deviation, Q waves, and not only conduction abnormalities or VT. Now, for ECG, you would be thinking about what is the role of the halter and what is the actual role of the echocardiography in these particular patients. Nonetheless, in this, in this consensus statement, the agreement was that if you have either symptoms, ECG, or echo abnormalities, then you should perform advanced imaging modalities such as MRI and PET. Otherwise, you shouldn't really investigate these patients further. Now, very recently, we had the ATS um, guidelines um, for diagnosis and detection of sarcoidosis. And the recommendation was that for patients who do not have symptoms or uh, signs of cardiac sarcoidosis, it is appropriate to perform an ECG to everyone. And this was the conditional recommendation with very low quality evidence. And um, an echocardiography or a halter monitoring should be decided on a case by case basis. On the other hand, if you had suspicion of cardiac involvement, then patients should have an MRI. Therefore, if patients had um, symptoms or ECG abnormalities or echocardiographic abnormalities in an echocardiogram that was performed, um, Incidentally, then you would have, these patients should have an MRI. 
still very low quality evidence. Now, where, these, where do these uh, evidence come from? So this is a study from 2008, quite a long time ago now, where, we, where the conventional uh, tests such as um, ECG, Holter and echocardiography, as well as symptoms were integrated to find out uh, how, how can they predict the detection of cardiac sarcoidosis in an outpatient setting. The problem with this one was that the, the, the Japanese ministry criteria were used uh, to detect, but still you could see that the actual um, sensitivity and specificity of ECG and echocardiography, as well as Holter, was quite low. The symptoms had uh, a sensitivity of around 46%. Now, in my um, PhD, where we tried to screen patients with cardiac MRI in the general sarcoidosis population, we found that actually symptoms have very good sensitivity and specificity. So it's a a very reliable marker. And when you add ECG, so if you look into the current guidelines, symptoms and ECG performance, you have a sensitivity of around 69% with a specificity of 46%. On the other hand, if you scan all patients with cardiac MRI, you go up to 100% of sensitivity and 100%, almost 100% of specificity. Now, I want to bring your attention to the uh, second highlight, uh, highlighted section where if you perform a halter and not an ECG, you can see that the sensitivity was improving significantly, or, although you were losing specificity. So that, that is something that you, you, we need to consider. And I would say that um, symptoms should always be um, uh, uh, questioned because it is a very sensitive tool. Then. I think that overall, you, we have to consider uh, Holter, especially in a symptomatic population, especially in a patient who reports palpitations and or dizzy spells or pre -syncope. Now, um, what is the, what is the, um, is it appropriate to use the MRI in an asymptomatic population? A study by Nagai et al. So that actually, even if you detect cardiac sarcoidosis in about 13% of asymptomatic patients, their, um, their, their follow-up was not associated with any events, but the actual follow-up was only two years. Now, why is the, the other question that was raised as a, as a result of uh, our data was, why is the echocardiography associated with so poor sensitivity? And I think that the, the reason for that is that um, the, uh, the, the measurement from echocardiography that is included in the diagnosis of uh, cardiac sarcoidosis is only the left ventricular systolic function, in particular the ejection fraction. Therefore, a lot of other uh, uh, abnormalities that we more frequently detect than a decline in the ejection fraction, such as the regional wall motion abnormalities, or even the GLS um, reduction are not taken into account. Um, and coming to the GLS, I think that this is a new um, promising echo technique that um, appears to be detecting subclinical cardiac disease. And studies so far have shown a very good association between GLS and um, uh, leg aluminum enhancement on MRI, as well as PET activity. In one study, I published in 2015, uh, there was actually a very good association with major adverse events in the, uh, during follow-up. Now, um, we, the problem with GLS is that it's not validated. It may vary depending on the uh, device that you use, but overall in the, uh, the cutoffs that have been used, a, a minus 17% is considered to show the best sensitivity specificity. Um, if we move on to the general population, we have now, uh, this is again a table from the Heart Rhythm Society consensus statement. We now know that there is a group of patients who have a highly uh, higher likelihood to have cardiac sarcoidosis. And therefore we may consider that we have to screen this population. These are patients who present with AV block, but I would expand that um, in patients who may present with VT, which is unexplained, or even new onset heart failure, which is unexplained. Um, if we, um, in this, in the, the, the heart rhythm consensus statement recommended that we perform a high resolution CT scan or even uh, advanced imaging modalities to exclude sarcoidosis this time in patients who present with an advanced AV block and they are relatively young. Um, 
if 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 I if we look into the published literature with regards to the unexplained findings and prevalence of cardiac sarcoidosis, you could see that in unexplained AV block in a young age, around 34% of patients had cardiac involvement. Um, but this also was quite high in, in patients presenting with idiopathic or unexplained ventricular tachycardias and abnormal PET scans were 42%. Still very small cohort of patients. Now, um, you can see that 17% had histological confirmation in a cohort of patients with unexplained cardiomyopathy and ventricular arrhythmia. So the more that you look into um, uh, sarcoidosis using some of the advanced imaging, the more patients you identify. Um, the, the, the guidelines that I referred to was that um, they, have give, uh, they have at least given uh, to me and our group um, a greater sense of how we should be screening patients um, uh, with regards to the cardiovascular risk in general. So we see that the, gen the male gender has a higher prevalence of cardiac abnormalities, and even in cardiac sarcoidosis, we have seen that, that the male gender is more is a predominant um, uh, gender diagnosed with cardiac involvement. Then we should always remember about the ischemic heart disease and the fact that the risk increases after 40 years old. Um, I will skip this, which is um, the assessment of the patients with uh, unexplained syncope or ventricular arrhythmias, and just say that in patients with syncope, uh, according to these guidelines, uh, an ECG should always be informed, but also we should consider Holter monitoring as well as echocardiography and cardiac MRI. So you see that the patients who are developing a more advanced symptom like syncope, they have more tests performed and uh, we wouldn't really limit ourselves to what we are performing. So I think that we should be getting some sort of um, uh, guidance from these kind of guidelines. Um, also, an important other factor is that we now see that even in patients who are presenting with syncope, you, you should be looking into BMP according to these guidelines and you should be excluding coronary artery disease. E uh, electrophysiology studies should be performed in patients who do not meet criteria for a primary prevention ICD according to, or not should be performed, can be useful, but not for uh, patients who are meeting the ICD implantation criteria. Now, biomarkers, I think, is a, a new field which is quite important, and um, troponin is um, a high-sensitive high troponin has been found to be associated with cardiac involvement. Um, but um, in my experience, it is less frequently identified, but we do see more frequently elevation in the BMP, even at, in early diseases, although this is at levels that may not um, trouble a heart failure or a, a cardiologist in general. Uh, in our cohort, we found that um, BMP is actually a predictor of outcome, um, with BMP measurements above 200 being uh, significantly associated with um, if a, a composite endpoint, including death and uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So, coming to um, what we what we know is that in patients with known extra cardiac sarcoidosis, those that have symptoms and or ECG abnormalities should have an MRI. In the asymptomatic population, everybody should have a baseline ECG. But I would, I would suggest that um, depending on um, uh, uh, further investigations, I would, um, I would be inclined to perform a, a BMP measurement in all, in all the patients. And especially the patients who have um, advanced disease in the lungs, we tend to perform an echocardiogram to exclude pulmonary hypertension. So I would probably keep a low threshold for the performance of echocardiography. Now, our data showed that the patients who had Holter had higher sensitivity in detecting cardiac disease. Um, so it's a bit more difficult to say about a specific subgroup of these patients that should have a Holter, but this should be considered. Um, we always need to evaluate the cardiovascular risk and um, evaluate the um, ischemic heart disease risk factors in our patients, as well as the exertional symptoms, and always take a very good family history as well as a drug history and comorbidities when assessing these patients. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the Sarcoidosis UK, which is the, uh, the 
uh, charity for sarcoidosis in the UK, as well as the WASOP, the World Association for Sarcoidosis, and the Royal Brompton Multidisciplinary Team, which I'm very proud to be part of, and invite everyone in the Cardiac Sarcoidosis Symposium this year, which is an online event as well. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Vasilis. Really appreciate this uh, wonderful talk and, and highlighting the uh, importance of screening in the patients with extracardiac sarcoidosis. I think given the change in the schedule, I was uh, I went a little bit over time with the first session, but but maybe we'll have time for one or 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 just uh, two questions here. If anybody has any anything, um, you know, I have to say that even in patients who who don't have any of the sort of the triple findings based on this HRS algorithm, when we have done cardiac MRIs, I have found that um, in 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 about 10 or 12 percent of the patients, we have found positive cardiac MRIs, which have led to diagnosis of sarcoidosis that was silent on Holter ECG symptoms and echo. So I don't know, what, what, what's your take on, on the sensitivity of the HRS algorithm that, that currently exists? I mean, um, you don't have a gold standard to, to compare. That's the problem. So this is where everything starts and um, this is where the challenges happen. I think what we are now seeing um, more frequently, and that is something that we need to beat and have more um, data on, is that in, this, in the silent and the subclinical um, form of the disease, you need to be careful about the extent of GAD. So I think that we, we tend to see more patients with limited extent gut and no real evidence of a lot of inflammation. And that is the reason why this asymptomatic population tends to do well in the long run. So um, this, this particular population, although they are, uh, they do have cardiac sarcoidosis according to the guidelines, the actual risk certification is, the, their, their actual risk is low. Therefore, you know, it's, it's some of the patients that we diagnose, but then we just um, monitor for the sake of it, I would say. So it's more about, I think, when you are detecting someone who doesn't have symptoms to be able to detect um, a condition that is clinically significant. So you, you're in the, in the, So what I'm trying to say is that from the subclinical disease, which disease is a higher risk? And I believe that those patients who have a, maybe some regional emotional abnormalities or a slightly higher BMP, uh, something to indicate that their condition or a greater late gut, um, that some, some, these patients are probably going to be the more, the, the more tricky patients that you need to follow up. Then the other very important point in that one is that you need to identify those that have inflammation. And this is now an evolving thing because we now have a lot of clinically silent patients with inflammation um, that we don't really know whether how, how we should treat them, how tense the immunosuppression should be, and is this changing their natural history or not? So I think the moment that you identify some markers of structural heart disease, let's say, some raised BMP or some structural abnormalities on your uh, imaging, this is the moment that you need to be worried about, as well as a higher extent of late gut. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful point. I appreciate that. And, and it's a great segue to Dr. Bernie's uh, talk uh, about changing the natural course of this uh, disease state. But thank you, Vasilis. And, and you know, I'm going to ask Bonnie maybe to share the link to this symposium that you're having in, in June. I wasn't aware of it myself, so I think it would be a great asset for uh, participants here to consider joining that and, and listening to the talks there. So thank you once again. And with that, uh, we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. David Bernie. Uh, Dr. Bernie is... Uh, a colleague, a friend, a mentor, I would say, too, mm -hmm. uh, one of the leaders in cardiac sarcoidosis in, in Canada, and, uh, um, and obviously uh, heavily involved in, in research, not just on monitoring the natural history of the disease, but also on how to treat this, this diseased uh, state that has very limited uh, randomized controlled trials. Dr. Uh, Bernie is a staff uh, electrophysiologist at the uh, University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He's a full professor as well and uh, once again has been heavily involved in the development of uh, data guidelines, uh, clinical trials, and he's mentored a number of different individuals, not just in Ottawa, but uh, really throughout the world now, uh, just um, 
uh, a tribute to his leadership in, 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 in this field. And, and he will be discussing cardiac sarcoidosis treatment and management, knowns, known, known knowns and known unknowns. He's not going to talk about the unknown unknowns, which probably is a good thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> You got it, you got it, Mustafa. Thank you very much <clears throat> for the introduction and um, my disclosures. Um, so I, I really kept my talk pretty basic. Uh, what we know now, what we'd like to know, and how we get from uh, one to two. So what we know now, um, we know lots about the epidemiology. We know, we know how to diagnose it usually. We know a lot about the prognosis now. We're starting to understand which patients should get devices. I'm not going to discuss that because uh, Jordana Cron is going to discuss that. We don't really understand what isolated cardiac sarcoidosis is. is, is. I'm, I'm not going to discuss that, but just to, because Vasily brought that up, and there's tremendous confusion amongst clinicians and in the literature about isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. So I'm going to give you my opinion just briefly, and that is number one that you know clinically isolated cardiac sarcoidosis is quite common, um, but truly isolated cardiac sarcoidosis, meaning inflammation in the heart and and nowhere else in the body, um, is phenomenally rare and probably you know I actually don't think there's such a thing as isolated cardiac sarcoidosis truly isolated because it is by biology a, a systemic disease. You know you may not be able to see it elsewhere because of the limitations of imaging. Um, anyway, that's my editorial, my, my view on isolated cardiac sarcoidosis, because there's a lot of confusion in the literature and amongst clinicians. And the major part of my talk is going to be about, um, you know, the fact that we don't know very much about how to treat the disease. So we know lots about the epidemiology. Um, um, you know, this is often quoted 5% with clinically manifest disease. 15 to 30 percent of patients with clinically silent disease. I couldn't agree with uh, Vasily more that, you know, this subgroup of patients seem to have a very different natural history from this group. You know, in, in our experience, this is a very benign uh, subtype of the disease compared to this subtype. But Vasily also mentioned, you know, it, 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 we are understanding a lot about the epidemiology of, of clinically manifest disease. And, and what we found over the last few years is it, is it, it, it often initially presents to cardiology with no previous history of, of sarcoidosis in any organ, and it's often clinically isolated to the heart. And he mentioned the, the idiopathic heart block uh, patients, and, and this is our paper here where we found a third of all comers uh, with complete heart block, aged less than 60, had cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, and this is our VT paper where we found that uh, 28%, for, uh, 14, um, and um, flipped through that. And, and Vasily also mentioned the idiopathic heart failure group. So this is um, a nice paper where they looked at the histology of um, LVAD core samples. I couldn't believe the size of tissue they take out when they put in an LVAD and it's massive. Um, anyway, they had a look at those and they found uh, 6 out of 177 had undiagnosed cardiac sarcoidosis. And this also makes the same point. This is a, a transplant paper where they where they looked at the explants and found that 3% had, no, uh, ha had not been diagnosed um, and before they came to transplant. So we do also know more and more about how to diagnose it. And um, um, these are the guidelines from 2014. And um, I wanted to let folks know that there is moves afoot to, to do an update of these guidelines. And I'm hopeful we'll get approval to do that quite soon. And, and I think you'll see some substantial changes uh, to the guidelines. One of the most um, interesting part is going to be the debate as to whether we need a positive biopsy or not. Um, the field is moving away from positive biopsies. I mean, the general sarcoidosis uh, field has moved away. The most recent European Respiratory Society guidelines have, are, are no longer mandating a positive biopsy for the diagnosis of exocardiac sarcoid. And I think we'll probably come to the same conclusion for cardiac sarcoidosis as well. We're also learning a lot more about the prognosis of the disease. Um, you know, the Finnish group have done wonderful work and 
you know, they're, they're really illustrating the point that with early diagnosis of the disease, uh, much earlier diagnosis of the disease, uh, uh, judicious use of ICDs where needed, and also modern heart failure management, you know, that the survival from clinically manifest uh, CS has, has completely been uh, transformed over the last 15 years. So I'm not going to talk about these two things, leave that to Jordana and to another day, but I am going to talk a lot about uh, how how little we know about how to treat the disease. So there's never been a um, um, a completed RCT yet. There's there's three on the horizon, but there are these systematic reviews, and I'm just going to go briefly through uh, one of these um, just to show you how little we know about what treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis actually does. And it's an absolute moot point, uh, as Mustafa mentioned, as to whether we're affecting the clinical and uh, the natural history at all. So this is our systematic review. Only 34 citations out of over 3,000 made the cut. Um, the best data relates to AV block and uh, the potential of recovery with steroids. And again, these are none of these are randomized trials. These, this is just all observational data. But the bottom line is the bottom line um, of 178 patients in the literature treated with steroids or other immunosuppression, about 40 percent recovered AV conduction, 21 patients in the literature um, and none of them who weren't treated and none of them recovered AV conduction. These are the data on patients whose LV function was initially normal. Um, and the suggestion from these data is that treatment with steroids and other immunosuppression is, is associated with uh, stability of LV function, whereas there's 13 patients in the literature that weren't treated with immunosuppression and there was a substantial fall in their rejection fraction, but only 13 patients and you know lots of potential bias. These are the data on patients uh, with intermediate LV function at the time of presentation. And this suggests that perhaps there's some uh, hope for a small improvement in ejection fraction with, with steroids and immunosuppression. But the caveat to all of this is that many of these patients, when they're diagnosed, um, are also treated with standard guideline uh, directed medical therapy, often with CRT as well as appropriate. So, whether or not it's the steroids and immunosuppression that makes a difference or it's, or it's everything else is, is a moot point. Um, there are a few patients in this subgroup that weren't treated and uh, their ejection fractions seem to fall. The last group of the patients are with initially severely abnormal LV function and the summary of this data seems to suggest that steroids and other immunosuppressants make very little difference to ejection fraction. And, you know, intuitively, this makes sense because these patients are perhaps with the ones with extensive scarring. But again, you know, caution you that the numbers here are extremely small. And the context to all of this data is none of this, very little of this data was using modern PET scans to direct medical therapy. So I think there's a whole new chapter to write about this. Now, if you think the previous data was unclear, that probably the most unclear data is is whether immunosuppression or um, has any effect on arrhythmias. In fact, there's a little hint in the literature um, that perhaps steroids and immunosuppression actually works in the opposite way and makes arrhythmia worse. And we certainly found this. And uh, there's um, when we looked at PVC count um, before and after treatment and non-sustained VT, they actually went in the opposite direction and quite significantly so. So there's much more to be learned um, about this. But the major problem with all of this is just the quality of the data. Um, you know, they're all cohort studies that in, in the literature. Most are retrospective, most are single centre, none are randomised and there's no a blinded endpoint adjudication. So, um, and you know, perhaps reflecting this um, is is just how much clinical equipoise there is in the community. And um, we're undertaking a a survey of of treatment practices around the world at the moment. And some of you may have answered 
this survey already. Um, um, but these are the summary of the first 18 responses. And I just sh show you this because this just came in the, um, just the other day. But the bottom line is there's real clinical equipoise on this. So this first question was, how often would you treat the following clinical scenario of CS? Clinically manifest, metabolically active CS. So these are patients with ex at the extreme end of the spectrum. 90% would always treat these patients, but you know, 11% sometimes won't treat these patients. These are patients with um, clinically manifest disease, but metabolically inactive CS. And some some physicians would um, would treat these patients. Uh, uh, some never, some always, some sometimes. So all over the place. These are patients with um, clinically silent disease, but metabolically active CS. And and uh, Vasily just mentioned this uh, subset of patients. Some physicians would always treat them and some would sometimes treat these. And then these are the patients with clinically silent, metabolically inactive disease. There is some consensus here. You know, most folks would never treat these patients, but there are some physicians who would treat these patients. Um, do you require histopathological confirmation of sarcoidosis before starting immunosuppression? Um, and this really speaks to the fact that the field is is moving away from requiring positive biopsies. You know, sometimes um, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck. It it probably is a duck. You know, your young patient, 55, uh, with complete AV block, gets a PET scan, lights up like a Christmas tree. We stop biopsying these folks, um, um, and I think the field is is moving uh, to that, and this slide suggests that. Do you require an FDG PET for starting immunosuppression? Most physicians do, are using PET guidance now. Um, what's your usual first choice agent? Most people are using prednisone as their first choice. The doses vary widely. And then this is very interesting. We asked if prednisone is your first choice, when do you start taping the dose? And this is all over the place. Some people after a month, some people after three months, uh, some people after interval um, imaging. So, uh, okay, I'll skip through that. So, you know, there's a lot of clinical equipoise out there. And um, this is what we do in Ottawa. And um, this was made up in my shower one night uh, as a reasonable thing to do. We treat for three months and um, almost always we see a positive response to treatment. We then taper steroids over another nine months and complete a month, nine, 12 months of, of treatment. And then we repeat this PET scan three months after stall, stopping all treatment to look for, for relapse. And you know, the, the, the reason that our nuclear medicine friends love this disease as much as we love this disease is that, you know, the PET scans are just spectacular. It's like, you know, the heart's on fire and then you've doused the, the flames of the fire. This is an interesting, uh, th oh, sorry, this is this is some a publication of um, the results of our first 21 patients that went through the algorithm that you um, that you saw just a moment before. Um, basically, we treated the uh, first 21 patients. Of these patients, um, uh, 19 out of 21 uh, responded substantially to steroids. Uh, those 19 then went on to complete one year of prednisone, and then we repeated the PET scan three months after stopping prednisone. And we found that uh, 12 out of 19 uh, uh, patients uh, relapsed. Um, this is a typo in the paper, I never noticed that. So seven out of 19 were non-relapsers um, and did not require um, uh, uh, treatment in the long term. And this, Dr. Greenland showed this already, so this ma it makes the same point that, uh, you know, these were the non-relapsers here and these were, were the relapsers. So, you know, this is similar to what we know in the pulmonary sarcoid world, that there are patients with acute forms of the disease, subacute forms of the disease, chronic forms of the disease. And the only way you have of working out what subtype of the disease patients have is by temporarily stopping therapy and seeing if the disease relapses or not. And the PET scan gives us a wonderful way of, of doing that. So what would we like to know about how to treat this disease? We really want to know which patients to treat. 
um, do we need to treat everybody? We don't need to treat all pulm we don't treat all pulmonary sarcoidosis patients. Far, far from it. Many of them are just um, observed and spontaneously recover. Which drugs uh, first, second, and third line? How long to treat for? Um, you know, again, making the point of acute and chronic form disease. And the other thing is how best to response how best to assess response to treatment and what are the goals of care. My own bias is that I aim to treat symptoms and progress, prevent progressive fibrosis. There is a school of thought in the literature that also wants to suppress every pixel of FDG uptake, and that's unknown whether that's required or whether the goals are just uh, number two, number three at the bottom there. And this is a great editorial from Mark Judson, who's, who's a real thought leader, and, and he's making the point, why doesn't anybody want to cure sarcoidosis and neglect of disease termination? I think that's a very important editorial. So now going on to designing clinical trials, because that's really the only way that we're going to advance the field, but it's tough to do because it's a rare disease. And, you know, we can never expect to use hard clinical endpoints because there's not enough of those. We could try and come up with a fancy softer clinical endpoint, some composite endpoint. And, you know, there's ways of doing this with with uh, hierarchical um, endpoints where you get different points for the severity of your of your uh, endpoint, one point for uh, VT, two points for AV node, blah, blah, blah. You can do that type of thing. But when we talked, when we, we eventually came down to a choice of three, either to use an imaging surrogate endpoint a biomarker surrogate endpoint or a disease uh, specific quality of life. But there's other uh, conditional considerations, and I, met, I talked about this this morning, that you know the rules are different for rare diseases when you're doing clinical trials than if you're doing clinical trials in common diseases. Um, whenever possible, the gold standard should be used. That's the same. But what's other things are different. Um, one thing that's different is the primary endpoint is often inadequately quantified and validated, but the absence of a good reference data strengthens the case for randomization. And this is the opposite to what we teach in, in diseases that are common. In diseases that are common, we always teach that, you know, you've got to validate your end, primary endpoint before you do your clinical trial. But because these patients are, are rare, um, it's the opposite. We can start the clinical trials much earlier. The other thing that um, I learned from my reading is to aim for simplicity and um, also to consider pragmatic compromises on uh, significant levels, greater type one error um, um, and bigger error margins, all to, to reduce your sample size. And you can also extrapolate from other diseases at, in, in, choosing your, in choosing your endpoint. So how do we get from one to two? And that's by doing excellent. RCTs and there's there's three of these at, at various uh, uh, points of recruitment. This is a uh, Jordana Cron's uh, trial that, um, and you'll hear from Jordana later. But this is um, this trial is using a biomarker uh, surrogate as a primary endpoint. Highly um, highly uh, uh, selective uh, CRP is the primary endpoint, and using uh, IL one blockade on top of standard therapy, um, and uh, they're making excellent progress. This is a Japanese trial that, that um, um, is looking at the use of antibiotics on top of, of ther steroid therapy with the, the rationale that um, propino proponeobacterium acne may be part of the, the cause of the disease. Um, and they, ran, they, they were planning to randomize 80 patients, but they recently communicated with the PI of the study and they've run out of money. Um, so uh, they're going to show the results very soon. And this is this is my effort, um, um, not just my effort. Many folks on this call's effort, uh, which is the CASM trial. In this trial, we we started with a super simple hypothesis, and again, that comes speaks to the uh, the the advice to keep your first trial simple. And we just hypothesized that methotrexate in brief low dose prednisone will have non inferior efficacy to um, the gold standard of stand of uh, standard prednisone. But we also hypothesize that the experimental regime will, will result in significantly better quality of life than standard dose prednisone. Very simple design, one-to-one -one randomization, open label, but with blinded endpoint analysis. We decided to focus on the patients at the extreme end of the spectrum. 
um, um, with advanced disease, active disease, active PET scan, treatment naive. Um, and again, the randomization is, is super simple. So just a standard dose of prednisone with a maximum dose of 30 milligrams against a very straightforward prednisone methotrexate uh, combination. The primary endpoint, we went with an imaging surrogate after hundreds of hours of debate. Um, we couldn't use MRI because almost all of these patients have got devices. So we're using a nuclear imaging um, assessment of um, SCAR um, some perfusion rest score. And we've got multiple secondary outcomes. And, um, you know, I, I tell anybody that will listen to me that, you know, one of the things I hope from this trial is, is not just the randomized component, which is going to be fascinating, but for the first time in the, the field with all of these clinical trials that we're doing, we're going to have clinical trial standard uh, endpoint adjudication and clinical trial standard uh, data as well. So the stu sub-studies to me are going to be uh, as interesting, if not more interesting than, than the main outcome, just to, to move the field forward. And there's multiple um, secondary endpoints and multiple papers, and anybody can have a paper if they want one. And this is the sample size. Um, we were very um, liberal with our um, uh, with our inferiority margins. Again, you're allowed to do that for rare diseases. Um, so we got the sample size down to 97 per group. And we've been funded now. And, uh, you know, it, it, we're starting to make excellent progress. Um, it was a struggle through COVID, um, but we've got lots of centres helping us now. And uh, we're up to 68 patients. And if we can recruit five patients a month, and we're very close to getting to five patients a month, uh, we can get the trial finished uh, recruitment in two years and the results in, in two and a half years. So um, it's very exciting. We have lots of core labs. Uh, we've got three core labs as well and, and many opportunities uh, for sub-studies as well. So I'm going to stop there and uh, take uh, any uh, questions. No, thanks, David, for being a leader in this field and trying to generate some some evidence for us going here blindly treating patients not knowing what uh, what to expect. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask this question that Kristen raised, but I'm sure there's going to be varying uh, degrees of, uh, of potential uh, opinions. So in, in patients with very severe disease, so LV dysfunction or significant VD, VT burden, who I assume have active inflammation, although that wasn't mentioned in the question, do you still try to decrease the immunosuppression at one year or do you go lifelong? Who, who, who do we treat? For a short period and who do we treat for longer periods? Do you, do you have any kind of uh, guidelines or criteria that you use? Yeah, I, I generally use two things um, or three things. Number one, I try and work out if they're acute or chronic. So if, if they get a previous diagnosis of pulmonary sarcoid five years ago, then by definition they're already chronic. So that influences my treatment. But if, they're, if this is the first presentation of uh, sarcoidosis, then I'm, um, I, I don't know if they're going to be acute or chronic. So I follow that protocol. If during that nine months of treatment es de-escalation, they become unstable uh, with flare-up and arrhythmias, I don't stop the therapy without repeating a PET scan. If, however, during that nine months, they've been completely stable, I stop, uh, stop the therapy at the end of the nine months. I don't repeat the PET scan. I repeat the PET scan after, after, the, after the extra... Um, three months. Um, um, the one caveat to that, the other thing that I'm always cognizant on is is the risks for the given patient. So if they're starting and if they have normal LV function and they still have normal LV function, a trial of stopping therapy, is, and they have an ICD, a trial of stopping therapy is safe. Um, and we showed that in our paper, nothing bad happened. I'm a little bit more worried if they don't have an ICD, but that's a rare patient these days. Um, I'm more concerned if they've severe ventricular dysfunction. I'm much a little bit more cautious there. I guess I'll ask the question another way. Are there some patients where you would treat sort of indefinitely or for, for a long period of time? Yeah, no, we are. Uh, what I didn't show in our algorithm is that, you know, the relapsers, we then start them on second line therapy and we're actually starting them on monotherapy with methotrexate and find that methotrexate suppresses most of those patients. And then we're 
treating them for three years with methotrexate, and then we're repeating the exercise of stopping therapy and looking for relapse. And what we're finding, actually, we haven't published this paper, is that after three years of methotrexate, if they've been clinically stable and you stop it, they almost never relapse after that. So, you know, there there, there does seem to be a substantial number of patients that you can wean off treatment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to get into this in a few minutes here when we have the uh, different centers explain how they do things. But uh, I have to say, like, um, it's always challenging to know what happens with respect to clinical relapse because you, you will see LV dysfunction from chronic pacing. You will see VT from scar without active inflammation. Um, and and some patients who have heart block, like you might they get older and they get, you know, degenerative heart block. So, so it becomes challenging to know in those clinical scenarios when therapy should be reinitiated or not. Do you use PET scans in those scenarios to uh, kind of guide your decision making uh, with respect to whether there's active inflammation or not to reinitiate therapy? Yeah, no, they always, you know, we're trying to learn as well, you know, but we've done this a number of times and almost always it's not relapse that's the problem. <laughs> they just got VT because of the scar. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Dr. Swigum wants you to publish that paper about your uh, recurrence rate or your relapse rate after you discontinue immunosuppression. So, so she'll, we'll be waiting for that one. <laughs> On it. <laughs> we'll give you some homework. Um, all right. So with that, um, I am kind of keen to, to, I'm excited to hear about how different centers uh, treat cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, so we will start uh, with, and thank you, by the way, David, for, for that uh, very elegant uh, presentation. And we all look forward to the CASM RC, uh, RCT uh, results, of course. Um, um, so we will start with Montreal. Uh, and the organizing committees, I'm very uh, happy to be here today presenting our experience about who and how we treat. So I'll be representing my team in Montreal. So you can switch slides. I have absolutely no specific disclosure with the presentation. And you can switch slides. And uh, before uh, starting the presentation, I definitely wanted to acknowledge the team I'm working with because I, I definitely found that treating those difficult patients is super important to share a clinical decision and expertise with, with a team. And, and I, I've been very happy to work with them. So uh, at Montreal Heart Institute, we in fact uh, open a cardiomyopathy clinic, which treats uh, patients with infiltrative and inflammatory cardiomyopathy. We're three cardiologists uh, uh, evaluating those patients and treating the patient. Myself, Dr. Parra and Dr. Tremblay Gravel. We have an amazing nurse working with us as taking care of the pacing, patient, Karine, and our secretary, Anan. And of course, we're working very closely with our uh, electrophysiology team and our nuclear medicine team. They are very involved and dedicated to the project and very interested. So you, we can switch slide. Uh, the clinic has opened in April 2019 as we've reached some uh, amount of patients that uh, definitely uh, were uh, keeping us very busy. Um, at this time, the clinic is growing fast. As you said, it's a rare cardiomyopathy, but not that rare, way more frequent. We are now following in the clinic about 276 patients, and half of them are sarcoidosis uh, patients, most of them proven and treated, and some of them under investigation. We receive about one to seven new consultations a month, and half of them would be for a sarcoid evaluation. As far as our experience, we do find that those patients, they, they need very, very acute care as outpatient. For us, they are as heavy as following patient when we do the, the heart uh, transplant evaluation or follow-up of our heart transplant patient. They do need guidance, they need rapid follow-up, they need a lot of explanation and reassurance, but also they need a lot of uh, follow-up about their medical adjustment of immunosuppressors, complications that can be related to treatment, but also follow-up of the disease that can be very active and sometimes um, very dangerous, depending on the course, the clinical course they have. So usually a sarcoid patient during the, its first years uh, of treatment for evaluation and treatment, we see them about four to eight times a year, depending on the, the rapidity and the severity of their presentation. And once a sarcoid patient is stable, we do follow them about two times a year. We can switch slide. So uh, it's been presented before, but uh, we are following the guidelines that are there to guide clinicians about who we should be treating. So, of course, the patient that presents 
with obvious clinical manifestation of cardiac sarcoidosis and have proof of inflammation, we will start the treatment using the usual guidelines. So you can switch slide. So I wanted to present you just a, a schematic presentation about how we decided to address or uh, guide clinicians about taking the decision in the evaluation of the uh, sarcoid patient. So once there's a suspicion of cardiac sarcoidosis with the usual presentation, uh, conduction abnormalities, arrhythmias, or heart dysfunction, then we'll investigate for uh, cardiac sarcoidosis when appropriate. To do so, we usually will uh, do our evaluation using the PET scan, which is very, uh, very useful for us in proving the presence of inflammation. We will usually try to have the MRI at the same time to evaluate the extent of the disease, mainly how much fibrosis there is. And we will also uh, pay attention if we can have information about inflammation on the MRI, even though we know it's not as precise as the PET scan would be for inflammation presence. When we do the evaluation of the patient and we have a high suspicion of cardiac sarcoidosis, we go up front doing the full workup uh, as knowing the patient might need immunosuppressors. We just want to make sure to be ready to start it as soon as possible. So we will do the workup to rule out any uh, viral infection at the same time that would be a problem uh, with immunosuppression. So we do all the serologies in our patient. We rule out tuberculosis and we try if we have the time to update their vaccination state uh, status as a lot of our patients will, uh, will need to have immunosuppressors long term. So while doing that, we will eventually receive the results from our imaging uh, investigation and we'll see if it's uh, isolated cardiac sarcoidosis or if it's an extra cardiac and cardiac sarcoidosis, which is most of our patients. We, at this time, uh, will try to have a biopsy to confirm diagnostic if we can. If there's an extra cardiac manifestation, we'll go for the biopsy, usually using the adenopathies and with the help of the pneumologist. And if it's an isolated cardiac cardiomyopathy, if it's very extensive, we'll try the biopsy to have the, the diagnostic. But if it's very focal, we'll move forward with the treatment uh, right away without doing the biopsy. When it's an isolated cardiac uh, sarcoidosis, we also um, started to do, uh, for sure, to rule out Lyme disease. We've had a couple of cases with overlap clinical presentation in the past year, about three patients presented with AV blocks that were reversible, uh, treated for Lyme disease. So they're shared presentation, and we just want to make sure Lyme has been excluded. And we've also had a couple of cases of genetic cardiomyopathy, mainly desmosomal cardiomyopathies, having recurrent myocarditis that would light up on PET scan that can be confusing with isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. So we tend to propose also genetic workup in the isolated uh, sarcoidosis, cardiac sarcoidosis. So once we do have the confirmation there is inflammation and we're agreeing that there's a clinical manifestation typical of cardiac sarcoidosis, then we'll start uh, the treatment. Our usual way of thinking, uh, and it's uh, I have to emphasize that this is not guideline, it's more to guide our decision and what we've been doing. And some, some of the medication are off-label, uh, but uh, more and more cases uh, are now available proving that it can be useful. So usually what we do, we, we treat more aggressively patients with severe extent of the disease. As for example, if there's an ejection fraction lower than 45, or if they have malignant arrhythmia, we will be way more aggressive in introducing prednisone maybe at higher dose and combining upfront with methotrexate. If they have a uh, lighter presentation of their cardiac sarcoidosis with a normal ejection fraction or mildly reduced, or if they have only an isolated AV block, then we'll do the treatment, but with prednisone only and sometimes with lower dose. Our strategy is usually to repeat PET scan at three to four months and see if there's a full response or not. If there's full response, we'll start the weaning. Our way of weaning prednisone is usually to wean slowly over three months to reach about 50% reduction of our prednisone uh, dose. And we will repeat PET scan at three to four months after this weaning to see if there is reactivation. And we'll do the same process every three to four months 
until we find the lowest dose of medication that will keep the disease silent. From our experience doing this protocol, we've seen most of our patients reactivated at some point of their weaning. So most of, a, of our patients will have the strategy of long-term maintenance therapy. So if we have PET scans that are still uh, very active, uh, if, if we're using prednisone only, we will add methotrexate. If they're already on both medication, our strategy is usually to switch for MMF uh, methods and we're starting to have more and more experience with the biological agent, for example, anti-TNF and adalimumab, and we've had very good results uh, in those refractory cases with those agents. Uh, that's usually our protocol that we use as an outpatient when the patient is stable, of course, that would be a little different for our inpatient when they are uh, unstable. So we can move to next slide and I'll finish on this one. Uh, only adding that, of course, while evaluating a patient with cardiac sarcoidosis, we are always a little scared about their risk of sudden cardiac death. So we do at all time the evaluation and adjustment if they need uh, ICD protection or uh, consultation with our EP team. And uh, we will, of course, continue the optimization for heart failure uh, optimization as recommended by guidelines. So I think I will stop on that for our part and just to make sure that the other uh, team will have the time to present also. I mean, um, I was trying to be brief because I didn't want, um, I thought it was five minute presentation just to um, share some of the experience um, rather than going through the diagnostic or management algorithm. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I think that Basically, we are dealing with a multidisciplinary approach in the management of cardiac disease. And um, as, as previous um, speakers mentioned, we are, we're having different domains of, um, of treatment. And one is the sarcoidosis specific treatment that um, David very elegantly uh, described, um, as well as then um, focusing on the electrical and the functional components from the heart point of view. And I think that what is um, needed in terms of guidance would be to understand, for example, in device implantation, um, what should we do first? Uh, what is the appropriate time of uh, immunosuppression introduction, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, I think broadly, without trying to complicate things further, I think that we have sarcoidosis specific therapy, um, arrhythmia management, and heart failure management. Now, uh, with regards to heart failure, obviously you know more than me, but obviously the, um, the update of the CRTD improvement in the, uh, in the cardiac function is an important part that we have to consider, especially because we are considering ICDs very often in cardiac sarcoidosis, but also the use of the and Tresto uh, in our population maybe earlier. Um, with regards to the uh, sarcoidosis specific therapy, I think that we want to treat active myocardial inflammation uh, with a aim to avoid any progression to permanent myocardial damage. Now, we want to treat definitively um, and we want to know whether there is any evidence of reversibility. Um, and um, we would like to maintain the effect of induction therapy uh, in the longer term as much as possible. Now, what I think is going to be crucial is the original presentation. Is this an acute event? Is this um, hot uh, active cardiac sarcoidosis? And the assessment of the disease behavior in this context is quite crucial. Then the second thing, as previous um, presenters mentioned, is the uh, disease extent and the level of abnormalities that uh, patients experience, such as the LV dysfunction or, or arrhythmias. And the level of the disease activity, especially because we're talking about uh, sarcoidosis-specific therapy. As mentioned, we, we now are waiting for the outcome of David's um, uh, clinical trial to determine uh, to have more data about the conventional management that we use, uh, but overall corticosteroids and um, second-line agents, I would say primarily methotrexate, 
but because we're talking about the adult bearing uh, population, um, uh, azathioprine may be used uh, alternatively and uh, anti-TNF are um, uh, agents primarily in fliximab that we use in refractory disease. Um, now, I think we traditionally, we used to use oral corticosteroids as a first-line therapy, introduce second-line agents when we wanted to reduce the steroid dose or when, when we had refractory disease with steroid monotherapy, and we tend to use anti-TNF when we had refractory disease despite conventional management. Um, in, our, in our department, we tend to use quite frequently intravenous methylprednisone infusions as induction therapy. So this is three consecutive days of high uh, intravenous steroids, followed by much lower oral steroids than what we would use if we were going to treat them with oral steroids. Um, and we, uh, this aims uh, in providing rapid action as well as reduction of the side effects from high steroid doses orally. And we tend to introduce a steroid sparing agent quite early when we want to provide definitive therapy and when we have belief that there is significant level of reversibility. Um, now, I think that it's very important for us to understand what the, the, the term reversibility, and we had the AV block, which was one, but we also have evidence of intense myocardial inflammation, and that's why we tend to use myocardial perfusion in addition to the FTG PET to see whether there is a, what is the extent of the underlying damage. Now, the challenge there is the, the fact that the myocardial perfusion is not as good as the late gadolinium enhancement on MRI to detect the, the fibrosis. So at the multidisciplinary level, we try to bring in the images together, the MRI and the PET, in order to detect how much dam permanent damage we have and how much reversible damage we may have. Although, as, as you know, these are things that we are um, and trying to understand at the moment. And therefore, we have to remember that some of the late gut may be inflammation. Now, the other thing is that you may have uh, the other end of the spectrum, whether you have severe disease with extensive LV dysfunction um, and um, low or moderate grade of myocardial inflammation, in which case you are not expecting that this patient has high reversibility. Um, so your treatment would be more to uh, prevent any further progression. Um, I think that we have to be very careful about the sarcoidosis specific therapy, especially when, when it comes to devices as well as when it comes to patients with concomitant pulmonary hypertension. And um, although we don't see a lot of fungal infections in cardiac sarcoidosis patients, as we see in fibrotic pulmonary sarcoidosis patients, we have to, I think, always remember about the complications of infections in this particular uh, subgroup of patients, which we intensely uh, 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 immunosuppress. Now, this study has been the initiation of uh, a lot of discussion around the use of steroids in sarcoidosis, and that's why we have moved to even considering methotrexate as a start-off therapy uh, and forget about the traditional steroid approach. Uh, we have had very good results with, anti with infliximab in refractory active cardiac sarcoidosis, but the main challenge there is that we find a lot of difficulty in withdrawing um, therapy. So whenever we attempt to stop the disease relapses. Now, um, I just wanted to bring up some uh, principles just to help with the discussion, but we have to be aware of the risks and benefits uh, in our approach, and we have to very have very clear treatment goals. This is an example of intense and low-grade uh, disease um, in a patient with preserved cardiac function. So as you understand, the intensity of immunosuppression would be different and the treatment goals would be different. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, we, we have focused on mycotherapy, which is the masterful activity with cat-like observation, as Athel Wells would say. And um, we have been observing many patients with either low-grade activity and preserved cardiac function or even absence of activity in, um, and um, uh, late GAD on MRI. Now, just to say and show you um, some results in 100, approximately 131 patients with serial PET imaging, 
um, that I, I, I did a very brief analysis for you. And we can see that um, there was, in those patients that we used induction therapy, um, the patients had more improvement detected in the, um, on PET, as well as improvement on, the, on their cardiac function on serial echo and PET scans, uh, as opposed to those patients that did not have induction therapy and were on oral steroids. Um, now, the, the challenge here is that there is a bias in, in us selecting IV induction therapy in patients with more intense inflammation, and therefore it's more difficult to understand whether this is the reason why they had better response, but um, it, it was more about mentioning this um, to the group. Um, I wouldn't like to um, you know, puzzle you with a lot of things, but obviously the treatment in cardiac disease is over, often driven by lungs. And what we have seen is quite a lot of difference in uh, the doses of the steroids. And there are two studies that have used quite high doses for pulmonary disease in cardiac sarcoidosis with not much difference. Um, what I would like to finish off is this table where we, there are several reasons that we have to take into account when we are approaching management of the disease and decision about intensity of your immunosuppression. Thank you. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, so obviously there is a wide range of you know, how people like to start treatment, how people like to um, change treatment and monitor for therapy. Um, so obviously it's, it's, it's all kind of um, consensus based, um, uh, geographic based, uh, experience based. Um, so I'm not sure that, that there is really any one correct way of doing it. I, I like some of the slides that that Vasily shared about about sort of the uh, looking at all the different factors, and I think we all kind of do it subconsciously. Maybe we don't uh, we didn't show our slides to to highlight it in terms of assessing the risk of the patient and and the different both clinical as well as the imaging um, presentations that we have in, in when we're assessing the risk of the patients. Thank you all for presenting your your experience. Uh, we will move to a, another very important aspect of care of these patients, which is sudden cardiac death risk stratification and device therapy for cardiac sarcoidosis patients. And um, once again, great pleasure to have Dr. Jordana Kwan from the Virginia Commonwealth University uh, presenting on this topic. She is, uh, like David, one of the um, uh, thought leaders and, and involved, of course, in clinical trials to uh, help us navigate this very complex uh, uh, field. She's a graduate of, from Princeton University and completing her uh, medicine training at John Hopkins and has uh, been heavily involved in, 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 once again, guideline development and clinical trials to help guide us uh, in, in managing this, this condition. So, Jordana, thank you very much for joining us from the east side of the, of the United States. So I'm glad we have the entire continent uh, covered here. <laughs> thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Let me share my slides. Can you see those slides? We sure can. Yes, please go ahead. OK, OK, great. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about um, sudden cardiac death risk stratification, which devices for which patients. OK. So I have no disclosures, but I do have some funding. I have some funding from the NIH uh, and the American Heart Association, and also from my university from our Clinical and Translational um, Research Award. Okay, so arrhythmic manifestations in cardiac sarcoidosis range widely from asymptomatic ECG changes to sudden death which is a dreaded complication. Conduction abnormalities are very common, seen in up to 62% of patients. Um, it can really affect any part of the conduction system, most commonly a right bundle branch block, but also left bundle branch block or any degree of AV block. Sinus node dysfunction is much less common. Sudden death may be due to ventricular arrhythmias or complete heart block. Uh, and sudden death may be the initial presentation in up to 17% of patients. 
as we've heard today, it's a very difficult diagnosis to make, and uh, mimickers include myocarditis and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So let's dive into some of the data that we do have. We've talked about the lack of great data, but we do have some pretty good data helping us decide who's at highest risk for sudden cardiac death. So this is a series from Finland over uh, from years 1998 to 2015 and looked at 262 patients who were diagnosed with cardiac sarcoidosis. A small number were originally diagnosed with giant cell myocarditis and later converted to CS and 62 cases were found at autopsy by screening more than 800,000 death certificates. They found the most common first sign of cardiac sarcoidosis was complete AV block or high degree AV block, followed by heart failure symptoms. So let's take a look at this in a Venn diagram. You can see here AV block is the most common first presentation, followed by heart failure and sudden cardiac death. Now, when they looked at the mechanism of death um, related to cardiac sarcoidosis over the years, starting in 1998 to 2015, you can see that sudden death is shown in green, while heart failure deaths are shown in blue. So over the years, the major mode of, of death still remains to be sudden cardiac death. So the primary findings of the study are that AV block is the most common initial presentation, but sudden cardiac death can be the primary presentation in 14% of patients. And we look at mechanism of death, sudden cardiac death is much more common than heart failure, post-transplant complications, or non-cardiac complications. When we go to the guidelines to look at some of the recommendations for devices, um, two things I wanna highlight is first, that device implantation can be useful in cardiac sarcoidosis, with an indication for pacing, even if the AV block reverses transiently. The meta-analysis shown previously showed that about 40% of patients will have reversal of their high degree AV block with steroids. Uh, but even if it reverses, it can be unpredictable in the future and we still recommend implanting a device. And then another um, point I wanna highlight is that ICD implantation can be useful in patients with CS and an indication for permanent pacemaker. I'm gonna show some of the data that backs this up, but basically if your sarcoidosis patient needs a pacemaker, a defibrillator is almost always the right device to put in. Again, we go to Finland to look at some of their data. They had 325 cases of CS and 143 of them presented with high degree heart block, either Mobitz type two or third degree AV block. This included 112 women and the mean age was 52. And what they found was that over uh, 2.8 years, 23 had sudden cardiac death and 19 had ventricular tachycardia. So let's break down this data a little bit. They divided the patients into three groups. Lone AV block, these are patients that had normal ejection fraction. We have the middle of the road group, patients that had EF 30 to 50%. And then the sickest subgroup that had ejection fraction less than 35%, or had already had ventricular tachycardia. When we look at outcomes over time on the left, we see sudden cardiac death, and over here on the right, sudden cardiac death or VT. I don't think it's surprising that the patients that had had VT or very low EF had the worst outcomes. That's shown here in red on both slides. However, the middle of the road patient shown in green or the lone AV block shown in blue really had fairly significant rates of both sudden death or the combination of sudden death and VT over time. And how high was that risk? When we look at the cumulative rate of sudden death or VT in lone AV block, over five years, that risk was 24%. And I think that's really a staggering number in patients that had a normal ejection fraction. And so that's something we have a little bit of trouble wrapping our heads around in EP. We like to know what the ejection fraction is and really focus on that low EF group. But in sarcoidosis, we have to look beyond the ejection fraction. So the authors here conclude that the consensus recommendation to implant an ICD whenever permanent pacing is needed seems well-founded. And I wanted to stop at this point to show some histology because I, help, I think it helps to keep this in mind as you're thinking about these patients. So here's a typical representation of someone with cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis. Here's the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The myocardium is brown and all this white area is granulomatous involvement. Now, a lot of times it's more patchy than this, but I show this because it has the typical involvement of the septum. For whatever reason, cardiac sarcoidosis has a predilection for the basal septum. 
And remember that the electrical system runs down the septum, and that's why these patients typically get high degree heart block, they can get bundle branch blocks, um, and it's because of this involvement of the septum. So as we go forward and thinking about this, if patients have enough involvement of the septum to cause heart block, they also have the substrate to have reentrant ventricular arrhythmias. Now, here's another example of a patient that had more extensive scarring. Um, here, the left ventricle is shown on the other side. Here's the right ventricle. Um, again, when patients have enough involvement to have heart block, they also are at risk for ventricular arrhythmias. So we're going to talk a lot about the different things that make patients higher risk uh, for needing a defibrillator. This slide was shown before, but I think it's very important. PET scan, in addition to helping us follow response to treatment, also can be used for prognosticating patients. Again, if patients have normal FDG and perfusion, so no scar and no inflammation shown in green, they do the best. If a patient has either abnormal perfusion or FDG, shown in blue, they do sort of a little bit worse. And the patients have the worst outcomes if they have both abnormal perfusion and abnormal inflammation. We also know that the amount of late gadolinium enhancement or LGE on MRI also identifies patients who are higher risk. You can see over here on the left that patients that had more than 14% uh, late gadolinium enhancement did worse than patients that had lower amounts. And patients with more than 22% LGE had a, a much worse survival probability. We also know that it matters where that involvement is, where the late gadolinium enhancement is. And this is um, a paper that we published with University of Michigan um, that showed that patients that had right ventricular delayed enhancement, shown here in the dotted red line, had worse survival probability than those that didn't. So it's not only important how much late gadolinium enhancement you have, but also where it is located. So how much scar is too much scar? There's been different studies um, that suggest, you know, more than 20% is too much, more than um, 8%. And I don't know that this uh, has fully been answered yet, but we'll take a closer look at how much scar is too much. Um, so this is um, a recent study that I think is very important. This is published by Norton Swan et al. in 2022. And they looked at patients that um, from Finland, there were 398 patients that had cardiac sarcoidosis. They all had uh, clinical cardiac manifestations. Uh, and most of them had histologic diagnosis um, in 193 and extracardiac in 205. So about half and half that were definite versus probable cardiac sarcoidosis. Now, most of the patients had a class one or 2A indication for ICD at baseline. When we look at these indications, they included both the 2014 heart rhythm consensus statement and the 2017 guidelines for management of ventricular arrhythmias. So of course, class one indications include prior cardiac arrest or sustained VT, or a very low ejection fraction, less than 35%. 2A indication included patients whose EF was greater than 35%, but had an indication for pacemaker, history of syncope or presyncope, suspected to be arrhythmic uh, or inducible sustained VT at EP study. And then finally, uh, 2A in the ventricular arrhythmias guidelines was EF greater than 35%, but scar tissue on MRI or PET scan. So what did we find? What they found is looking over here on the left, the cumulative incidence of sudden death, and they divided the patients into those that already had an indication for ICD, shown in red, compared with those that didn't, and there was no significant difference in the outcome of sudden death. There was an, uh, a difference in the cumulative incidence of sudden cardiac death or VT, so patients that had an indication for ICD um, had a higher rate there. But what's very important about this study is that they found that in the low risk group who didn't have a, an initial indication for ICD, the five year risk of sudden death approached 5%. So the current ICD guidelines fail to distinguish a truly low risk group. And when they look at that group, um, at, so they found that about 85% of patients uh, presenting with cardiac sarcoidosis symptoms already had a strong to modest indication for ICD. But among those that didn't, among the 15% that didn't, over time, more than 50% of those developed an indication for an ICD or had an arrhythmic event over five years follow-up. 
So these are the patients that didn't initially have an indication and over time they developed either a significant arrhythmia or an indication. And what are those indications? Well, either the ejection fraction dropped below 35%, the patients developed high degree heart block, or they had a significant uh, you know, aborted sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac death. So it really shows that we're still having trouble finding patients with clinically present sarcoid in the heart that are truly low risk. Well, what about the role of electrophysiology study? And this is an, uh, a meta-analysis that EP studies done for risk stratification. And they looked at outcomes including ventricular arrhythmias, ICD therapy, death, LVAD, or heart transplant. They initially reviewed 544 articles, reviewed 52 of those, and ultimately included eight studies. And what they found was a pooled sensitivity of 0.7 and pooled specificity of 0.93. Importantly, the sensitivity and specificity remained high in important subgroups that we care about. Patients that had probable cardiac sarcoidosis, patients that had no prior VT, and those that had preserved or near-preserved ejection fraction. There were a lot of limitations to these studies. Uh, most of the studies were small and retrospective. There were variable EP study protocols that were performed, and a positive EP study likely led to an ICD and thereby increased detection of non-fatal arrhythmias. What about CRT? Well, let's start off with the Block HF trial uh, that looked at patients with high indication for pacing with AV block, had New York Heart Association one, two, or three, and had ejection fraction less than 50%. And I show this, this was not a sarcoidosis study, this was a, an all-comer um, heart failure study, but it showed that patients that had biventricular pacing uh, did much better over the long term than those with right ventricular pacing. And this primary outcome was time to first event of death from any cause, urgent visit for heart failure requiring IV therapy, or uh, an increase in left ventricular systolic volume. Um, so I think a lot of our patients fall into that category, and I usually do clinically recommend using biventricular pacing in patients that are going to have a lot of pacing and have an EF of less than 50%. Um, but when we look at the data, specifically in sarcoidosis patients, there's not a lot of great data. This is a Mayo Clinic study that looked at 55 patients who underwent CRT over a 20-year period. 62% um, were male, and the mean age was about 59. Most of the patients underwent CRT defibrillator, and 67% were upgrades. What they found is that at six months, there was no significant improvement in ejection fraction or left ventricular and diastolic diameter. And there were a lot of poor outcomes over the next four years, with 25% having heart failure hospitalizations, 20% going on to get a heart transplant, 2% LVAD, and 13% died over time. However, I want to caution you that it's difficult to interpret these data because there really was no control group for this. And there's really been no study comparing patients who have indication for CRT who receive it in sarcoid versus those that don't. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. Now, what to expect in follow-up, I think, is a really important question. And some of this was alluded to before by prior speakers. So there's sort of three studies that have looked at ICD therapies. We did a study of 235 patients uh, from international centers. There was a University of Penn group that looked at patients and University of Colorado. And overall, when we look at follow-up, the annualized appropriate therapy ranged from 8 to 14%. Adverse events were fairly significant in this group, up to 17%. So it is important in this group to think about inappropriate shocks because of atrial arrhythmias and also the high risk of infections because the patients are immunosuppressed. Now I wanna just uh, finish up here by showing you a few slides on data of ventricular arrhythmia management. I'm not going to go in how to, into how to perform a VT ablation for these patients. But I sort of want to present this as a, a generalized approach to management of ventricular arrhythmias because they're very common. Um, most ventricular arrhythmias and sarcoidosis are reentrant arrhythmias due to scar tissue, but we can see triggered activity and abnormal automaticity. Um, active inflammation can play a role. As we've talked about before, there's some controversial data showing whether or not immunosuppression actually helps arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, and steroids may cause worsening of ventricular arrhythmias and may even worsen aneurysm formation. In terms of antiarrhythmic therapy, 
I most commonly use ambiodarone and sodalol. We avoid class 1C agents like flecainide and propafenone. I always, I typically start with sodalol um, because ambiodarone is difficult to use in patients that may already, that may, they may be very young and they may already have pulmonary or liver disease. So this is a study uh, that looked at not, 780 non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients who underwent VT ablation. And this is sort of a cautionary tale. These patients are stratified by their underlying cardiomyopathy etiology. We see myocarditis, ARVC, HCM, and sarcoidosis shown in red. This is just to say that of all the patients from different etiologies, the sarcoidosis patients had the highest recurrence. So VT ablations in these patients are very challenging. These patients have multiple different circuits and they're complicated patients. So uh, while VT ablation is very important part of strategy to manage these patients, um, we have to take it with a, a you know, bit of caution. These are very difficult ablations to perform. We have some data from the Cardiac Sarcoidosis Consortium. This is a nested study within our um, international consortium of 158 patients that had cardiac sarcoidosis and underwent VT ablation. The primary outcome was a composite VT recurrence, heart transplant, or death. And the data show that VT ablation was successful at eliminating VT storm in 82% of patients and also significantly reduced the risk of ICD shocks post ablation. However, one and two year survivals free of the primary endpoint were not great at 60 and 52%. But when we look at how these patients did um, from 30 day ICD shocks before ablation compared with after ablation, we can see that in combination with other therapies, uh, the VT ablation can really help these patients out. So I'd like to leave you with these take home points. In cardiac sarcoidosis with heart block, an ICD is the right device regardless of ejection fraction. All patients with clinically manifest CS should be considered for an ICD, and our current ICD guidelines fail to distinguish a truly low-risk group of patients, and this is a, an important area for ongoing research. So with that, I'll say thank you so much for inviting me today. I've enjoyed the conference so much, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you, Jordana, so much for putting that uh, talk together for us. Um, well, well, I'm and, and thank you also for getting us back on track, as David, I'm sure, was getting angry with me here. Um, <laughs> I, I'll ask you a quick question and see if anybody else has any questions. You know, the, the one challenging group that I struggle with is, you know, we get a lot of patients who come in with acute heart block. They get a cardiac MRI in the hospital, which shows LGE. You do a CT scan, you don't find any lymph nodes. And uh, my EP colleagues, of course, they're, they're, they want to put an ICD in those patients, whereas I'm like, you know, isolated CS, it's less likely. Do we really need that ICD in that patient without any extra cardiac manifestation and no tissue? And all you have is a, is a, is a CMR because we don't have access to the PET scan. What do you do in that scenario? Do you always put the ICD or do you go with the pacemaker and reassess later? I think that's a really tough clinical situation, especially if someone comes in with heart block. Um, we've had the challenge where they have a temporary wire and they're not really stable to go to MRI. So I'll tell you our practice, you know, if they're very young, if they have any other indication that it might be sarcoidosis, if I see a significant, of, a significant amount of late gadolinium enhancement in a distribution that suggests sarcoidosis, I will put in an ICD for exactly that reason. We think that they would also have the substrate for ventricular arrhythmias and that we should protect them. Sometimes if I can't get an MRI, I'll send the patient to CAT scan. And we have had patients that go to CAT scan, there are no lymph nodes, there's no lung disease, and I will choose to put a pacemaker in those patients. If I really don't have an explanation, I have had some of those patients come back and do very well long-term. Other patients have also gone on when they're stabilized as an outpatient to get a PET scan. And if the PET scan comes back with findings suggestive of cardiac sarcoidosis, I have upgraded some of those patients. So it is difficult because you're sort of pressed to make that early decision um, and you just make the best decision you can with the data you have. But we continue to go on and look for further evidence down the road of you know, cardiac involvement. Yeah, and, and we've had the patient diagnosed with, uh, of course, there's a lot of myocarditis that sort of mimics sarcoidosis. And I'm not sure that we are as aggressive with those and putting ICDs in them. And, um, uh, um, and I think we've had one, um, I don't know, it escapes me now, that inflammatory, that, that inherited condition. Um, um, anyways. ARVC? No, no, no. Um, 
I'll, I'll come to it. But David, what's your approach? Do you have the same kind of philosophy? Yeah, yeah. Um, we we published our data on on CT thorax. You know the, uh, you know we do a bit like Jordana. You know the CT thorax is pretty high sensitivity and specificity, like ninety five percent. So if we see no lymph nodes on the CT thorax and no um, nothing to suggest pulmonary sarcoid, we just put a pacemaker in. But we always do a PET scan um, in follow up, and you know a couple of patients we've had to upgrade. You know there are patients. Yeah, in whom the disease, you know, it, it, it is at, at such an early stage of its its progress that you don't see the lymph nodes to start off, and the lymph nodes then develop, you know, one or two months later. Um, the contrary is also true. If we ever see lymph nodes, and um, we always put an ICD in, and we've never ha we've never got it wrong yet. It's always cardiac sarcoidosis when you 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 follow these patients up. So, I think the CT thorax can be very very helpful. Yeah, and Fabry's is the one I was thinking of. Where you had one case of Fabry's that, of course, is a is a mimic on the PET scan too, and and that was so they ended up getting an ICD. Um, any other questions before we move on? So once again, uh, thank you so much, Jordana. Looking forward to thank your you. clinical trial data as well. Um, thank you. It's very exciting that there's potential therapies that we'll be using for cardiac sarcoidosis coming from both Ottawa and, and Virginia Commonwealth. So. Uh, we'll be eagerly awaiting. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jordana. So we're going to move on to um, the case discussions. We are quite behind, so I, I will ask all the uh, all the presenters to try and present in 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 five minutes their cases, so we get some time to discuss them. Here's Alessandro. I'll introduce Alessandro. So he's. Um, he's from uh, Italy, but he's sitting in the office next door to me at the moment. So he's our cardiac sarcoidosis clinical research fellow um, who's with us. Uh, do you want to share screen for a year from, he actually lives in Norway. The most interesting thing about Alessandro is where he comes from. So he actually comes from a little village in Italy called Prosecco. Um, where Prosecco, Prosecco is made. And he told me that everybody in his village um, is involved in the Prosecco making industry apart from his mum and dad who are the two doctors in the village. So I see Mario with his hand up there. Mario, are you uh, ready after uh, Alessandro to present? Okay, we'll go ahead with you, Alessandro. Uh, Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here to uh, discuss this case. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, our patient is a 63-year-old female. She has a previous uh, type 1 diabetes that is well managed and hypertension. She's admitted at our facility with a recurrent syncopies, and uh, we do see a very prolonged PR interval on the ECG and telemetry picks uh, several runs of uh, non-sustained polymorphic VT. The workup uh, is negative for coronary artery disease. Her uh, initial echo is uh, rather normal, and she has imaging consistent with um, uh, with uh, with sarcoidosis. I mean, with cardiac and extra cardiac sarcoidosis. <clears throat> so, the, given the clinical presentation, we make um, clinical diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. We implant a CRTD and uh, up, up up titrate the beta blocker to max dose and start treatment with a prednisone of 30 milligrams. What happens is that uh, within a month, she is admitted with her first shock, um, and then she has another shock uh, five months later. Then at the time of the first follow-up, uh, we are surprised to see that her uh, healthy function deteriorate uh, now down to 36%. Interesting, the, the controlled PET scan shows actually a significant reduction in FTG uptake, uh, both in her heart and in the lymph nodes. So we were kind of puzzled by the situation. We were wondering whether we picked the wrong diagnosis. Uh, is it because uh, she had extensive scar from uh, resolved inflammation? Perhaps she had ongoing inflammation or any other thing. And then we looked at the first, um, then I mean, we escalated the, the treatment with amiodarone. Uh, we put her on a GDMT. And uh, at the same time, we also did the first, uh, did a second uh, device uh, interrogation. What we actually see, we saw that we overlooked the first um, interrogation that the, her percentage of biventricular pacing was very low, and that was due to a significant amount of, uh, of PVC, uh, up to up to 28% of her total uh, beats. 
<clears throat> so then, then I mean, we I mean continued. I mean observing her uh, after three months again. Her uh, LB function uh, deteriorate uh, uh, even further, down to 25%. Uh, at the same time, her device interrogation showed that uh, uh, we had obtained a, a very good uh, percentage of ventricular pacing, and we had managed to suppress almost entirely her burden of a PVC. So we were kind of afraid in this situation. Uh, we we're kind of afraid in this situation. Uh, we uh, started uh, from scratch, did a new CT uh, coronary assessment that was normal. We even did the bio, uh, endomyocardial biopsy that ruled out the giant cell myocarditis. And at this point, we were just left with a concern for uncontrolled inflammation. Uh, even though she she had like I mean a consistent decrease in her um, in her FTG uptake uh, in in PET scan. Uh, however, a decision was made at this point to uh, to start her on infliximab. So she did actually receive one dose of infliximab. And at the next control, uh, so like, I mean, again, after one dose of infliximab, uh, her um, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, went back to uh, to baseline. And uh, her latest PET scan shows just, I mean, mild residual inflammation. Uh, the SUV max is um, uh, unchanged to 3.40. Alessandro, you're, you're not sharing your slides anymore for some reason. Okay. Oh, okay, I beg your pardon. Uh, let's see. There you go, it should be on. I mean, what, what we saw then uh, is that, I mean, after uh, yeah, additional three months, her uh, ejection fraction went back to normal and she's now asymptomatic and uh, she did not receive any further therapy from her ICD. I think, I mean, what we learned from this case is that the cardiosarcoidosis is an exceptionally arrhythmogenic condition. And uh, our data, uh, this case definitely supports our data that steroids may actually worsen the burden of ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, David has previously referred to this paper, um, and like I mean, uh, on a on a conclusion note, uh, ventricular dysfunction in my in in cardiac sarcoidosis, of course, should raise concern for ongoing inflammation. But I think that this case proved that PVC mediated cardiomyopathy exists and can can be an issue in cardiac sarcoidosis. That's it. Thank you very much. So th thank you, uh, yeah, thank you, Alessandro. This was a, a case that really troubled us um, with the ejection fraction, you know, suddenly collapsing like that, and yeah, um, and really unclear what it was, um, um, and really worried for joint cell myocarditis uh, um, as the cause of it, um, but you know, turned out to be a PVC induced uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, and uh, you know, we've seen I've seen another case very like this as well that we're just in the middle of at the moment with a PVC induced cardiomyopathy. And you know, our paper also showed that you know, uh, you know, if you get, if you treat these patients with steroids, their PVC burden increases threefold on average. Um, so I don't think this is a a rare observation. Any questions about the first case? Okay, um, thank you, Alessandra. We'll we'll go on to the the second case then for discussion. I was uh, thinking about uh, two titles. The first title was, when initiating treatment, what should I do with that patient with cardiac sarcoidosis and very heterogeneous and intense uptake of the myocardium on PET scan, who does not have a defibrillator. Or the other title that I think about is the danger of thinking too much and thinking too little. Uh, so taking care of those patients is kind of a challenging. And if you can uh, do a resume of how I feel at this time, let's say, and, and also when I take, take care of the patient, the frustration of not having all the answers or not being an, an electrophysiologist. Or I can say also that sometimes we expect too much from others, especially from electrophysiologists, because we would be willing to do that much for them. Next slide, please. At the study regarding patient with treatment for cardiac sarcoidosis, in about uh, the mean, uh, about 50% of the patient do does not have defibrillator. Next slide, please. Uh, in patient with normal ejection fraction with 
loan AVB at five years, about 24% of the patient have sudden death and ventricular tachycardia. So even in patient uh, with uh, pacemaker and loan AVB, the prognostic is not so good. Next slide, please. At UC PQ, about 15 of the patient, 15% of the patient doesn't have a pacemaker uh, or doesn't have a defibrillator, but about 85% of those patients uh, are having a pacemaker and a defibrillator. And if we look, uh, uh, about 44 patient, 44% of the patient with pacemaker do not have do not have a defibrillator, and that can be explained that patient had the diagnosis about a long time ago, when the, the uh, consensus was not uh, suggesting at that time that we should put a defibrillator when there is an indication for a pacemaker. Uh, change change the slide, please. So it can that can be explained also that patient uh, the diagnosis is not done in the referring center, and there is the a pacemaker is implanted at that time and, and then they're referring to us. So in, in this time, about 44% of the patient doesn't have a defibrillator even if they have a pacemaker. So the patient that I want you to present, present to you is a 41 years old man with high blood pressure and sleep apnea. The patient went through the emergency for hematuri, abdominal pain consistent with urolithiasis. He had an EKG and he had the first degree uh, heart block. Uh, a CD scan was made and the fortuitous discovery of multiple abdominal thoracic and uh, an angle lymph node was uh, was found. At the EKG, the patient, like I said, uh, in uh, in May, had a first degree art block. A consultation in hemato-oncology was done and they conclude that the, the, the were, there were no lymphoma. An angle lymph node biopsy was compatible with diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Then the, ref, the, the patient was referring cardiology and uh, here, and there was a normal ultrasound. So the, the ejection fraction was uh, normal. But the PET scan uh, show uh, a strongly positive PET scan that the cervical and mediastinal and inguinal lymph node. And if we look on the uh, cardiac PET scan, there was a very heterogeneous and intense uptake of the myocardium, in particular in the inferior wall, uh, reaching an SUV about 12.4, and also at the proximal and middle anteroceptal territory, reaching an SUV of 12. And there was also hyperactivity in the right ventricle, reaching a, a, a SUV level about uh, 8.2. So the patient didn't have any symptoms, so he didn't know why he was seeing a cardiologist. When we uh, confront the patient, he said that maybe he had some time palpitation, but he deny any lipot lipotemia or syncope. So I saw the patient at the beginning of uh, December, uh, and I, I start prednisone at uh, 40 milligrams per day with gradual withdrawal. And then I start at the same time, methotrexate at a dosage of 10 milligram uh, per week, because that's what we do here at the uh, at our center. We, we, we start uh, methotrexate at, at the beginning of the, the treatment. And about uh, eight days, uh, about 10 days later, the, present, the patient presented with, in the emergency with, uh, in a room with uh, dizziness. And uh, unfortunately, you cannot see the uh, EKG, but the patient was in ventricular tachycardia at a rate of 198, even if he had, uh, even if he had uh, visoprolol at a dosage of 2.5 milligrams. So at that time, me and Jonathan and Francois Philippon, uh, we uh, look at each other and we said, who is to blame? It's a, it's a teamwork. Teamwork is essential. They allow you to blame someone else. So everything thought that maybe the other one should have, uh, think about that. If we look at the uh, literature in the, let's say, Masato Segawa uh, in, in the past, he, he, he demonstrated that uh, about 29% of the patient when initiating steroid therapy uh, have in the first years of ventricular tachycardia and also uh, ventricular tachycardia. So uh, 70, uh, 29%, but 70% uh, of the patient that had that, had that in the first year. And it was also true for electric storm that mostly happened uh, during the 12 months 
after the beginning of steroid therapy, and it was uh, related to the positivity of gallium scintigraphy. And if you look also, as uh, David has said previously uh, in his study, including about uh, 20 patients, if we look at the, the period before the prednisone was start on uh, in the defibrillator, integrating the defibrillator uh, after the, uh, the start, starting prednisone, it was a threefold increase of uh, uh, PVC and also non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So what we have done in that patient uh, regarding the possibility of ventricular arrhythmia when beginning the steroid. So maybe we should have done a PES. Uh, in a previous study, the, uh, the, the predictivity of a normal PES is uh, uh, usually good in predicting, in predicting uh, event. Uh, but we have done that in some patient and one, in one of the patients, the PES was negative. And when uh, he had eventually, uh, uh, he had eventually a reveal and uh, he, he had done a polymorphic tachycardia. So it's not, uh, the predictive positive value is not absolute. So should we have given the patient beta blockers with or without amiodarone? So we have given beta blockers to that patient. Should have we start the immunosuppression in the hospital with cardiac monitoring? Since that time, we do that when the patient doesn't have a defibrillator and the uh, captation on the PET scan is uh, very heterogeneous and important with uh, ASUV that is very elevated, we start immunosuppression with the patient uh, being hospitalized. Uh, and a reveal, a holder doesn't protect the patient, so, but we have done that one time and the patient demonstrate that uh, it was not sufficient because the patient had a polymorphous, uh, polymorphous tachycardia. And maybe we should do the same and hope for a different result. So I don't think that this is not a good idea. So what I take from uh, our case is that not every patient is having a defibrillator. And when we confront with patient with very heterogeneous captation with a high SUV, I think we've got to think differently. Uh, if the patient doesn't have an indication for a pacemaker or defibrillator, maybe we should start medication in the hospital uh, with a cardiac monitoring. Do you have any comment, David? Yeah, I think it's number one, it's a great case, uh, Mario. I was just thrilled that you were gonna present this case. You know, number two, you know, we've, <clears throat> my own bias here is um, based on, on your case, but also a couple of my own cases and also that paper that we published that shows that you start steroids, you, you, there's a significant increase in PVC burden and non-sustained VT. I don't think I'm ever going to treat a patient again with steroids or other treatment without the backup of a defibrillator. You know, I don't, I'm not comfortable even starting in hospital you know you start that patient in hospital and um, you send him home after four days what's to say he's not going to have his event uh, in five days you know i had one recent patient that uh, he was referred to me and simultaneously referred to rheumatology the rheumatologist started him on steroids as an outpatient um, i called him up and said, you know, after two days of his steroids, stop your steroids straight away. I recommend it. Put your defibrillator in. We put the defibrillator in and started the steroids. And he had um, a VF arrest uh, uh, two weeks later. So, you know, there's something about uh, the disease round about the septum, his Purkinje system, interaction with steroids. It's very arrhythmogenic. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to treat another patient uh, without having a defibrillator. So are you saying that even if there's not an indication for a pacemaker, even if the patient has a negative EP, a PES, you consider putting a defibrillator in all patients? Yeah, no, no, not all patients, just the patients I'm going to treat. The, the patients with active cardiac sarcoidosis on okay. PET scan who have an indication for steroids. Again, you know, the guidelines are just guidelines um, and, you know, yes. we're gonna, and they're already eight years old and we're going to write, we, we're doing another version of them. Um, um, but, you know, my, my own anecdotal experience and, um, you know, listening to your case, our cases, it seems to me that uh, it seems reasonable to put ICDs in all of them. Okay, good.
Can I resu do a resume of what we do in Quebec City in about three minutes um, regarding the treatment? If, if you promise it's three minutes, because we're all, we've got one yes. more case it's, it's to about, it, It's about three minutes. So we've put together with Jonathan Baudouin a clinic of sarcoidosis uh, clinic, and we have, we've treated about 88, 88 uh, patients. All those patients had uh, positive uh, PET scan. And we all start prednisone uh, between 30 and 40 milligram and we wean between six and nine months. And in all patients, we start methotrexate at the dosage of 10 milligram per week. And we give that medication for about uh, two years in all patients. Uh, and uh, then we ask the patient if he wants to stop it. Uh, and we decide if uh, everything is going good and the PET scan, the controlled PET scan is normal. We, we stop the methotrexat. And uh, what we have found that we are, it's possible to wean prednisone in, uh, in more than 90% of the patient. And that at this time, uh, sure that not all patients had methotrexat for two years because we began methotrexat recently, but uh, in patients who are, who had an, uh, an abnormal ejection fraction, relapse is quite frequent, but we have seen relapse in patients with normal ejection fraction. So even if the ejection fraction is normal, relapse we have seen, and we consider methotrexate for a long period of time or definitely in some patients. So our attitude in, in the comparison to other is that we start methotrexate in every patient. It's very, very well tolerated. And we stop it at two years if everything is going good and the PET scan is normal. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's very uh, helpful, Mario. Thank you so much. Yeah, in the interest of time, we'll move on to um, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, my friend uh, Genevieve from uh, from Montreal Park. So um, I'll try to be as short as possible and clear as possible for the clinical case I, I've decided to talk about. Um, I was hesitating about which case I should decide about the spectacular one or the more uh, gray zone one. So I've decided to discuss one of the gray zone uh, cases that I've been uh, having to deal with recently. So I have no disclosure related to the presentation. We can switch slide. Perfect. So uh, this is a patient that arrived to me for consultation. He's 51 years old, a uh, male with his previous medical history of having a very severe psoriasis since age 15. His manifestation was mainly cutaneous and arthritis uh, with the related with psoriasis. He's been treated heavily in the past with different immunosuppressors already, including anti-TNF uh, agents, anti-IL-12 and 23, and methotrexate, and with incomplete response of his symptoms. He's been on brodalumab, another biological agent, anti-IL-17, for the last three years, with a very good control of both his arthritis and cutaneous manifestation. He's a triathlete, so very active patient. He's been doing some triathlon and Ironman during his 30s and early 40s. He, he's now uh, training a little less. He's been diagnosed with an hypertrophic uh, possible cardiomyopathy he was involved in a project research project for athletes and, and was incidentally found of having an hypertrophic uh, septal uh, thickening but with no LG at the time he got some follow-up but well, was lost to follow-up in cardiology after doing the research part um, he was uh, known for hypertension while controlled and perindopril and has had COVID in January 2022. He has very good health habits, no non-smoker, no drugs, no alcohol. He's an engineer, but no professional exposure, airborne exposure, and has one cat. His family history uh, includes a father who has pulmonary sarcoidosis stage one and a daughter that has also very severe psoriasis. So we can switch slides. His history, um, as far as the heart part, started with an hospitalization in an out, out hospital. It's not in my hospital that did happen, but he was hospitalized in April 2022, uh, consulting for respiratory symptoms compatible with pneumonia at the time. He was coughing for the prior two weeks, shortness of breath for prior two weeks, mild fever, no expectoration, no hemoptysis, COVID negative, and multiplex was negative. You can appreciate on the scan there was some ill 
infiltrates in the lungs that could have been compatible with uh, pneumonia at the time, and it was covered empirically with antibiotics. We can switch slide. However, on the, the scan, what they found was also a very big adenopathies, some very large one over three centimeters with a lot of necrotic centers. And it, there was a the description of this infiltrates, uh, uh, left lithrocardiac nodular consolidation, but also some nodules in the lungs and ground glass, uh, right lung affectation. Because this patient was immunosuppressed, there were some concerns about, of course, infection, but differential diagnostic in this case was lymphoma, cancer, and sarcoidosis. So he was referred to a local pneumologist for further investigation. We can switch slide. So the patient was investigated with a TEP scan. Their goal of investigation was, uh, of course, to see if there's any neoplasia, but it, it, they were also investigating for a possible sarcoidosis. In the protocol that was done is in, in, in a, the other hospital, they mentioned they did the myocardial suppression protocol to make sure they would also have the answer about sarcoidosis. However, when I met the patient, he didn't recall really if he did a special diet prior to his PET scan. So this PET scan um, was showing a lot of adenopathies that were highly uptaking. As you can see, it really looked like lymphoma when you look at that, but there was also an uptake of the lateral wall of the myocardium. So the team there wasn't sure if they could say there was an inflammation of the heart very focal of all the lateral wall, or if it was as described in prior presentation, one of those uh, not sufficiently or suboptimal preparation of the myocardium to diagnose sarcoidosis. So you can switch slide. The biopsy was done by the pneumologist confirming non cases granuloma, so compatible with uh, sarcoidosis. No neoplastic cells were found and the workup for infection was negative. We can sw switch slide. The patient was then referred to our clinic uh, in our hospital now because they were concerned about those findings as far as, as, far as the heart uh, on the TEP scan for further investigation and see what we think about sarcoidosis now that it has been confirmed extra cardiac sarcoidosis. So when I meet the patient, he's completely asymptomatic. So when I question him, there's no palpitation, no syncopal events, no shortness of breath. Since he's been treated for his possible pneumonia in April, and uh, he's class one. His biomarkers are all normal and only mild inflammation. His AKG show no uh, conduction abnormalities and no arrhythmias. We can switch slide. So when discussing with the patient, he was of, of course concerned about the possible cardiac sarcoidosis because of the TEP scan that was done in the other hospital. So while discussing with him, even though he was asymptomatic and because of the extra cardiac confirmation of presence of sarcoidosis, we did investigate it and say, we'll do an MRI and see what's going on with this TEP scan. While the MRI was helpful, but not completely helping us concluding about his case, as it showed 1% of LG, so very small spots of uh, late gadolinium enhancement in the lateral wall and the apex. Ejection fraction was normal. You can switch slide. And when they did the evaluation about inflammation, even though we know it's not as sensitive and as reliable, the concern was that they did see edema of the full lateral wall and inferior lateral wall. So we see that this is a complete, uh, this is more white than the other side of the heart. And this is concordant with the PET scan showing a possible inflammation of the lateral wall, even though we know it could have been only suboptimal preparation. But now we do have two exams that are putting us in doubt about subclinical affectation of the myocardium as being maybe an acute presentation of cardiac sarcoidosis with possible edema of the full lateral wall. So we can switch slide. So then again, I had to think about wh what to do now that we have those confusing information and what to do with this asymptomatic patient to help guiding the treatment and maybe reassure him or decide to, to guide treatments. So we did repeat the PET scan and coach our patient about doing the, the diet. He was super prepared and very collaborative and he did his diet very well. 
He arrived to the exam well prepared. However, we did found the exact same imaging of this full adenopathies uptaking very highly and this lateral wall that was also uptaking very avidly. Our team has started to dose uh, to see if the patients are really in cytogenic state, the beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, so when uh, this is very low, it, it means that the patient has, a, has not produced a lot of cetones and it might not be completely in the cytogenic state, even though it did the diet. So the team felt that the patient, even though it did the diet very well, was probably not well prepared or the myocardium was, was not fully suppressed. So they were more um, in agreement saying that it's probably just suboptimal. Uh, preparation of the myocardium, and they can't conclude about if there's really inflammation in this lateral wall. We can switch slide. So now that the exams uh, that we did, the imaging is not completely helping us deciding what we need to patient, I, I go back to clinic and then I talk to patients. So we have this, this patient with extra cardiac sarcoidosis that's been confirmed, possibly subclinical cardiac sarcoidosis, what was concerning for me and, and confusing was, is it possible it appears under biological treatment already on brodalumab? Um, MRI was not convincing, but still concerning about the edema and my light uh, gadolinium, and TEP scan was not conclusive. So I felt the guideline supports when in asymptomatic patient, we still have time, there's no clear indication about treatment, so I felt I had the time to read and discuss this case with colleagues. So you can switch slide. So I went to reading again because in that field we it's very active and there's a lot of data is coming out. So coincidence or coincidence between the presentation of severe psoriasis and sarcoidosis. There's been literature saying there is a lot of crossover cases about patient as it involves some lymphocytes deviation that sometimes forms psoriasis reaction and sometimes granuloma formation, so there might be an overlap of disease. And also, if you start reading the dermatology uh, field, when they use those biological agents, they describe, and I've been finding more and more presentation of paradoxical reaction to biological agent, when uh, not only brodalumab, but some other agents where patient deviated their reaction of lymphocytes in developing sarcoid-like reaction, and it is unclear if the disease of sarcoid-like reaction will uh, really take the same clinical presentation as the real sarcoid presentation. So it's kind of confusing to know if this case of sarcoid was provoked or declared uh, by the use of the biological agent in this specific case. So I've been, we can sw switch slides, sorry. So I've been discussing with the other team and um, we, because of this concern of paradoxical reaction and because of the extent of the inflammation he had in the TIP scan, the other team, dermatology and rheumatology, felt they needed to switch his treatment anyway. So they switched the biological agent, they introduced methotrexate, sulfazalazine, and prednisone. As far as the cardiologist involved, I just said I was unsure at this point that I could confirm if cardiac sarcoidosis was officially present unclear if he needed treatment that he was asymptomatic, but I was still happy that anyway he would have been on treatment for the moment. So I did propose to the patient and the team to continue follow-up, of course, with the patient and repeat MRI and probably try to repeat TEP scan another time, maybe two months after the change of medication. If ever sarcoid in the heart as will be confirmed. I have to say that I will have difficulty knowing which immunosuppressors will need to be used as is already on most of what the, the immunosuppressors we know to use in sarcoidosis at the moment. So we can switch slide. I just wanted to still finish that uh, my, my concerns and surprise about this case that appeared on biological agent as the other members that have been presented we did get a lot of great uh, experience in some other patients with very refractory sarcoidosis that's been responding very well to anti-TNF biological agents. So we, we use that. So this is why for me, it would have been a surprise to see sarcoid appear, but it seems that it's still possible and we should not rule out this possibility, even if a biological agent is already there for another disease. Um, I don't know if I, I have one other slide, if possible, so we can switch. 
So uh, two slides, sorry. So this slide is just to express that the, the, the possibility of treatment is really expanding about the different agents we can use. And we've been discussing about those asymptomatic patients, about when to treat. Um, so for me, is it according to extent of the presentation, intensity of SUV, or only wait about the symptoms to be appearing? Um, on the next slide, the only thing that I would have to say in my bias is patients are asymptomatic until being symptomatic, and you can never know when that will happen. I have a lot of cases that arrived very late in their presentation, and when we do the interrogation, for example, this patient, 30 years, 8 years old patient, pulmonary sarcoidosis, asymptomatic for many years, untreated because stage 1, his initial presentation in our center was sudden cardiac death in 2017, ejection fraction 30%. So he's been treated very aggressively about his treatment. You can switch slide. His evolution was uh, response on and off to different uh, immunosuppressors, but a lot of reactivations. And once we had the control, he fell more on the arrhythmic side, even though there were no inflammation, having ventricular fibrillation right away, uh, needing multiple shocks. And he finally got transplanted, sadly, because we didn't get the control of his arrhythmic state, even though the inflammation was gone. So that patient, if would have been uh, found earlier, maybe if asymptomatic at some times, maybe we could have prevented a very, very dramatic uh, evolution for him. So I'm always concerned about the asymptomatic patient that we're not treating. For sure, I would recommend close follow-up even if decision of not treating is there. So that's that's my bias of some patients that I've been seeing. I'm always scared. And I, I think be, because of what you've been discussing earlier about the risk of arrhythmias, we most of our patients have defibrillator, but I have to say that now I will be concerned to start treatment because some patients don't have the right away indication for defibrillator or pacemaker. So we do treat patients sometimes without having the device in. Um, so I will definitely uh, continue to follow up what the other groups do about that. Thank you for sharing the other cases. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, oh, three just fabulous cases, uh, PVC induced cardiomyopathy, uh, number two, uh, ventricular tachycardia without an ICD. Number three, just a fabulous case uh, from Geraldine. You know, my own bias looking at that imaging and, uh, you know, we, we're actually way over time. and We have to go to the wrap up and my own bias looking at that imaging, that looks like, you know, isolated lateral wall, normal variant. I would be very surprised if that patient's got active cardiac sarcoid, but um, I don't know if Rob Beanlands is still on or Richard Colden, one, one of our imaging experts. Uh, do you think that was isolated? Do you think yeah, that was I, I'm thinking the same. Yeah. Richard? I don't I don't know if Richard's either. Anyway, uh, we're going to wrap up there because we have to go back to the uh, to the communal session for just a little wrap up. But thanks to everybody for a wonderful day. Thanks especially to the presenters for some some great cases. We will continue to do this um, on a regular basis. I think we learn so much from each other. We'll we'll not we'll we'll tune up our uh, IT apologies for the IT issues. We'll also tune up. Uh, uh, it was me that actually did the final agenda and and uh, Mia culpa. I don't think I left enough time for discussion because discussion is you know so critical when we see such wonderful cases as this. So um so note to self next year more time for discussion. So thanks everybody. We'll wrap up there. If you could all go back to the main session if you've got time. There's a little wrap up session as well. Have a good day. Thanks, Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.